like to call the May 22nd Board of Selectmen meeting to order. And before we get started, I'd just like to announce in accordance with the open meeting law, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Is there anyone else recording this meeting? Uh, for the record, we have uh, audio recordings being made by the Telegram Gazette and the Arbor Mass Daily. So if we could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now, the first item of business on our agenda this evening is the reorganization of the Board of Selectmen, which is done at the first meeting annually after the annual elections. So to get uh, moving on that, I would like to open the nominations <coughs> for chairman. Uh, do we have any nominations for chair? I would like to nominate Mrs. Doreen Goodrich for chair. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, are there any additional nominations? Uh, none being heard, I would uh, put forth to the board a roll call vote for Mrs. Goodrich to be chair. And I will start with our newest member. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Liber Liberty? Uh, yay. Mr. Burton? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Goodrich? Yes. Mr. Holstrom? Yes. And that means we have a new chairman. Uh, congratulations. And I want to turn over the gavel. And I want to thank you very much for your chairmanship in the past. Thank you years very much. Well. It's been a pleasure. Thank Great. you. Thank you. We don't have to. You don't want to? No, okay. okay. Awesome. All yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, my fellow board members, and also to Mr. Holstrom. Thank you for your leadership over the last two years um, as chairman. Thank you. Um, I would now like to open nominations for vice chair. I'll nominate uh, Ken Holstrom. We have a nomination for Ken Holstrom. Is there a second? A second. A second for Ms. Silla Liberty. Are there any further nominations? I'll close nominations. And by a roll call vote, Ms. Silla Liberty? Yes. Mr. Berthiel? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Sure. The chairman votes yes. Mr. Holstrom? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Our vice chair. And congratulations yeah. to you. Um, before we begin public comment, since we have a packed house, I was going to save this till um, selectman member items, but um, <laughs> I think where we have a packed house and this statement is important, I'd like to read this now. We would be remiss without mentioning the significance of today. It was a year ago today that Auburn lost two of its finest. We lost longtime fire chief Roger Bellhumer after a long but courageous battle with cancer. Using Chief Coleman's words, Roger was a true pioneer in the field of in the field of fire service. His vision for the department is visible every day. On the same day, we tragically lost police officer Ron Tarantino in a senseless killing while in the line of duty. Ron was a larger than life personality who was always willing to help. He was a true asset to the department. So today, we ask you to take a moment and remember these heroes. We also ask you to keep our public safety officials in your thoughts and prayers as they continue daily to deal with the loss of these fine men. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Goodrich. The next um, order of business is public comment. We have Ken Ethia who wants to speak about Patrick Foley. Mr. Ethia, if you could come forward, please. Thank you, good evening, members of the Board of Selectmen, Madam Town Manager, Mr. Kasanovich. I would first off like to thank, I'm um, sorry, I would like to congratulate uh, so Selectman Low Liberty in his new seat and Selectman Carpenter in his reelection. Uh, I'm here tonight to tell a little bit about Patrick Foley. Some years ago, uh, we actually got a, uh, I guess I can't call it a committee, a volunteer group together and put a stone and a plaque in his name. Patrick Foley was a fire captain in the town of Auburn who died in the line of duty in 1930 and never really got much recognition whatsoever. Things weren't, they say the good old days, but they probably weren't as good as uh, maybe we thought they were. Patrick Foley lived on Rocky Ave 
worked at the Worcester Rendering Company that was uh, right across from Hampton Street on Southbridge Street. And on this day, uh, he was called to fight a fire on Andrew Thayer's property up on Package Yard Hill. It was a, it was a, a dairy cattle farm. And uh, Patrick Foley went to fight that fire and, and died. It was um, March 6, 1930, and uh, he was the first Auburn fireman killed the line of duty. Once we got the plaque in town, uh, well, well, let me tell you first off, it was the late Norma Card, Ken Holstrom, Chief Wynott, and myself that worked to get that stone put in. We had a nice celebration. But from that day to now, I always wanted uh, Patrick Foley's picture to be in the fire station so people could actually go in there in their uh, whatever business they needed to do and see his picture and uh, just know a little bit about him, or he was a true hero. The people in the museum always knew I wanted the picture, but we never could find one. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Richard Hedden, I have to thank him because he took a large picture, a group picture, and uh, did his magic on it. Made it into a nice picture that uh, is presentable and will certainly uh, fit well at the, at the fire station. Uh, I would also like to thank Renee Pease, who took that completed picture, and, uh, well, I'm going to show it to you in a minute, and did, uh, I guess they call it matting, had it matted for me so it, so it could hang and be something that would really look nice. Um, with that, I, I would like to ask Chief Coleman and I guess Ken Holstrom, I guess the both of you need to uh, come up so I could present it to you, if you would, please. I had asked Chief Coleman uh, a while back if he would put it in the fire station, and he agreed that he would. And uh, I, I just think it's going to be so special to have his picture up there. With that, I'd like to thank Chief Coleman and uh, Ken Holstrom. Chief Coleman. Thank you very much. Ken. Thank you very much. There he is. Oh, a spectacular picture. Spectacular. <clears throat> Can we turn it around for the viewing audience? Absolutely. Actually, you want to bring it up and show them? Sure. I want to turn it so that people can see. Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, thank you to the rest of the board uh, for allowing me to speak. I want to thank Mr. Ethier and the, the rest of the members at the Historical Society for working on this uh, project. This has been a, a long time in the making. We've been talking about this for uh, several, several months. Um, the reason that I asked uh, Mr. Holstrom to join me is, as everybody knows, he's a retired lieutenant from the department. He's uh, sort of the unofficial historian of the department. Uh, he is someone that we go to quite often when we're trying to, uh, to know the history uh, of the department. He keeps many of the records. Uh, and he was involved uh, in dedicating that stone um, uh, to Captain Foley behind the station. So I, I thought it'd be appropriate uh, that he assist in, in getting this uh, this evening. Again, uh, thank Mr. Ethia, thank the Historical Society. You know, we often talk about uh, never forget. Uh, Captain Foley has been gone for over 80 years, and uh, we currently have a small plaque in the, in the station that recognizes uh, the line of duty death. Uh, as the, the plaque indicates, he was the first. Uh, unfortunately, he was not the last. In the 60s, we lost Deputy Chief Doc Pierce. Uh, as well at another uh, building fire. Uh, so those two gentlemen, their names are in the station, uh, but this is the only photo that we have of, of Captain Foley. So we're, we're proud to be able to display it in the station. We will display it uh, honorably. Uh, so again, so we can live up to what, what we always say, which is never forget. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ethia. I'd like to say a little myself. Um, I did a lot of research on this. Uh, 
several years ago when I uh, wrote the history of the fire department, I had many interviews, and uh, some of the interviews I had asked people about Captain Patrick Foley, and there was not many stories told. Other than the newspaper clipping, uh, there was not much said. Uh, so it was a pretty quiet uh, event. Uh, the stories were not told, so it's one for the ages. My brother and I last year uh, went to Maryland, and he, as well as Doc Pierce, as the chief had mentioned, uh, registered in the National Fallen <coughs> Firefighters Memorial in Maryland. And uh, there was a brick down there in their name. Um, the obituaries, uh, pictures of what we had at the time, and um, newspaper clippings to identify exactly what had happened is down now in Maryland and is now recognized nationally. So this is welcomed and the fire department appreciates it, I appreciate it, the Historical Society appreciates it, and I'm sure the town of Auburn appreciates all he did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holstrom. Um, next send a public comment, we have Mr. Bob Platukas who wants to speak about signage. Bob Platukas, 231 Milbury Street. I'm here to request several signs for Milbury Street from Route 20 to the Milbury Line. Uh, the reason being, I was driving from Milbury from my favorite Italian restaurant and I was going at 25 miles per hour and a blue Hyundai whizzed by me on the curves in the Auburn side and I said gee I'm going 25 maybe they've raised the speed limit uh, I then went back over the road and realized I couldn't find a speed limit sign for Route 20 to the Millbury line or when it turns into Milbury Street turns into McCracken Road on the Milbury stretch either. So maybe we could cooperate with the town of Milbury. It's always nice to have about the same speed limit. Unlike uh, other parts of Auburn where we drive down and we go 100 yards and it's 40 miles per hour, and then it goes to 50, and it goes to 45. It gets kind of confusing for people out of town. We used to also have a real narrow sign there last year and during the snowstorm it disappeared. Uh, we don't know how but it's it was bent over. Uh, I, I'm requesting that you put that road narrow sign up again as you know I spoke years ago about the 18 wheels that tried to manipulate their way on Milbury Street and the curves and it wasn't working as one was going over and tearing up the berm. So I'm requesting that that road narrow sign be put back up where it was next to Santander Bank. When you have something precious, I think you should advertise it. Millbury Street, and it's the last of the signs I'd asked for, is the scenic road. If I drive in Framingham, they label it as a scenic road. Uh, so is it possible that we should advertise Millbury Street with a sign? as a scenic road because it's something special. Uh, it's a country road. It should go at a certain number of miles per hour. I, I hope there's a speed limit around 25 and not as fast as that Hyundai was going by me. Uh, so those were the three things, four things. Uh, a speed limit sign hopefully near Route 20 so they know right away what they're supposed to be driving. And as you enter from Millbury, it would be nice to have another sign at whatever the speed limit is, 25, 30, 40, whatever the police deem it appropriate. The second thing I'd like to talk about, and I was just talking with Ken East of the Air about this, and I didn't realize that he didn't know how to do it either, but wanted the information, is vets benefits. Uh, if you have a card as a veteran, as I do, I can get 10% off at Home Depot or at Lowe's. You buy a refrigerator, $1,000, get $100 off. It's a nice deal. What most people don't realize is you don't have to be on active service. You don't have to be a disabled vet to get the benefit at Lowe's. All you have to do is bring them your paperwork, which Ken was just telling me he's been trying to do for years. And if you bring uh, your paperwork to Lowe's, you get on their list 
in anything, if you're honorably discharged as a veteran, could be from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You don't have to be on active duty, which is what most people think. And you don't have to have the card to get health benefits, as I do from uh, Lincoln Street. Uh, and I just, uh, if there are any questions on that, I'd be glad to answer any of them. Thank you, Mr. Pachukas. We'll make sure that um, the DPW director and the town manager um, get answers to your questions. I, I think it would help our safety a little bit if we got some of those signs up. Well, Thank we'll, you very much. We'll check onto it. Thank you. The next item we have is a joint poll location hearing at 7 p.m., which we are past. Is there a representative from Verizon or National Grid here? <coughs> is there a motion to open the hearing? So move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of opening the hearing? Aye. 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 Opposed, so voted. Good evening. If you could just give your name for the record, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Erin Mitchell. I'm here as a representative for Verizon. Okay. And we have some information in our packet. Could you just explain to us in the um, audience sure. what, what the pre presentation is and what, um, what you're hoping to do? Yeah. Excuse me, sorry. Um, basically, Verizon is looking to place a new poll. Um, it's a stub poll um, on Millbury Street around 153 Millbury Street on the side um, as a guiding poll for poll 53 on the other side of the street. Right, right now, correctly, there is a rotting poll that they would like to remove and they would like to place a poll there instead so it would be a lot safer for this poll across the street. Right. Thank you. Do members have any questions? Yeah, if I may. Uh, so this uh, poll you're going to replace is going to be identical to the one that you are replacing. It's actually replacing a rotting. It's a it's a rotting like tree. It mm -hmm. used to be a tree. It's I like see. halfway. Okay. And I was looking at it in the bottom's rotting. So they would like to. It's more of a safety concern for the Thank pole you. across the street. Thank you. Are there any more member questions? Um, the abutters receive notification. Are there any abutters in the audience? Is there any public comment? Mr. Coyle. Excuse me. Bill Coyle, DPW Director. Uh, I did have an abutter come to my office and raise one concern regarding the existing tree, and they had asked that if Verizon was going to remove that tree. I'm assuming we're, they're going to put a new pole in the same location that they would they would have to remove it. I just wanted to confirm that that was going to happen. Just for the record, can you conf you know come forward again, please, and state whether it's your intention to remove that tree? Yes, it is their intention to remove it and put place the pole right where it is. <laughs> Thank you. If there's no further questions, is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Is there a motion regarding the petition? I make a motion that we um, uh, accept the uh, joint, the uh, poll location on Millbury Street, 153, as described. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion under the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Thank you for coming. Thank in. you. Next, we have a hearing. It's past 7.10. Yes, it is. We have a hearing on proposed stop sign to be located so far as to face westbound drivers on Booth Road at Prospect Street. Is there a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of opening the hearing? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The hearing is open. Mr. Coyle, please, if you could come up and join us. In your package, you have information and a photograph. <coughs> regarding this request, and Mr. Cordell is here to describe. Thank you. I, I received a request from a, an abutter on Booth Road who has a concern with uh, the lack of a stop sign. Uh, since the construction of Whitman Bailey Road, a subdivision off of Prospect Street began, what they've noticed was cars going up Booth Road and going across Prospect Street without stopping. Um, typically stop signs have a sp specific requirements for um, 
through the manual uh, uniform traffic control devices, the MUTCD, for the, their warrants. You don't, we don't always have stop signs when you go from a secondary to a primary road. On the, the uh, rules of the, the road, when we all receive our driver's licenses, we have to follow these standards and we, we have to stop. But at, from time to time, there are stop signs required. Um, and I did review this location. I felt as though the sight distance is inadequate when you're going up Booth Road. You actually lose sight of Prospect Street and Whitman Bailey Road almost appears to a con be a continuation of Booth Road. So I think the fact if we had a stop sign at that location, it would make it a much safer situation. So I, I would recommend approval for the stop sign. Okay. Do members have any questions of Mr. Coyle? I do. Mr. Uh, Liberty. So will we have a stop sign on the other side as well? So this would put in two stop signs, or would there just be one on? Whitman Bailey Road uh, is a private road, so I think that's something that um, it would have to be addressed through the planning board, but I don't think it would be an enforceable stop sign because it's a private road. I, I did look at the site distance, and I felt as though the approach on Booth Road to Prospect Street is inadequate. I believe from Whitman Bailey Road, the intersection is very well defined with the guardrail. Uh, so even if that was a public road, I think my recommendation would be for the stop sign on Booth Road and not necessarily Whitman Bailey. But again, with that being a private road, I think that would be something um, through the planning board process where it's an ongoing uh, development. Um, it would have to go through that process. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Is there any public comment? Seeing none, is there a motion to close the hearing? So Second. All those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Is there a motion regarding the approval or denial of the placement of the stop sign as requested? So moved. I'll make a motion uh, to approve the placement of the stop sign at the uh, end of Booth Road as proposed. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Liberty. <coughs> Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Thank you. So, Unanimous. The next item we have is a hearing to address complaints and concerns on outdoor entertainment license for Sheldon's Holly Davidson at 914 Southbridge Street in Auburn. And that is a 715 hearing, which we are past that time. Is there a motion to open the hearing? Motion to open. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Madam For Chair, if I may, uh, we just received some uh, additional information. I'd like to take a few minutes to let the board uh, see this information. You just got a chance to read through them. We just received this time, so I want to be sure that the board has had a chance to take a look at them. Okay. So in our packets, um, I'm sorry, at our table here is quite a bit of information, three separate packets that we just received tonight regarding letters um, and the police report and the report from town management and the fire department. Mr. Holstrom would like a few minutes to review this. Um, so we... We'll make a motion. We take a five-minute recess. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The board will stay here and review the information. And when we come back to order, um, we'll continue with the hearing. First, I would like anyone who is going to um, speak at this hearing tonight to come forward and be sworn in. Any abutters, any residents who are going to speak, please come forward. Also, if the manager is expected to speak. Excuse me? Regardless of the, um, Sheldon's. Thank you. Is there a representative from Sheldon's? No. Yes, he's here. Please raise your right hand. Yes. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. I do. Please be seated till we call you up. I'm going to invite the representative from Sheldon to go up to the podium there and identify yourself for the record. My name is Mike Vorkin. I'm the general manager. Thank you. 
Mike, you've received notification for tonight's hearing. Do you have any issues with the notification that you received? No. Okay. First, we are going to, from, to hear from town administration regarding this matter. Uh, through the chair, I would like to uh, bring to your attention that Fire Chief Coleman is here this evening, and he will be speaking to you on behalf of town administration for the fire department perspective on the incident that occurred. I also want to point out in your package you have a letter from the police department, from Sergeant Dan Lamoral, uh, explaining the event as he was there that day as well. And uh, unfortunately, the police could not be here this evening. There is a private event for Officer Tarantino's family this evening, and they are with Officer Tarantino's family right now. Um, but Fire Chief Coleman is certainly uh, able to speak to the incident. He did uh, deploy members of his department there, and everything else from the police department is in the report that you have. Thank you. Chief Coleman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will, uh, you all have a copy of the incident report that was uh, filed by Captain uh, Sean Steele, who was the shift commander uh, working on April 29th. Uh, so on April 29th, uh, around 20 minutes of 3 in the afternoon, uh, I received a telephone call uh, from Selectman Goodrich uh, asking if I could send uh, a fire officer to uh, Sheldon's located at 914 Southbridge Street uh, to investigate some safety concerns that were going on there relative to an event that they were having. Uh, after I hung up the phone uh, with Mrs. Goodrich, I notified the fire station, spoke with Captain Steele again, who was the shift commander that day, and asked him if he could report to Sheldon's uh, to investigate. I will read the narrative uh, from Captain Steele that you all have in front of you. Uh, so Captain Steele writes in his uh, incident report, engine three to the address listed, which on the report is 914 Southbridge Street, to investigate possible overcrowding, safety concerns, and egress issues called in by C1. On scene, engine three met with Selectman Goodrich and Selectman Carpenter, who were there to verify complaints called in to them by the citizens. While on scene, engine three noted the following, and he lists six bullet points. Overcrowding of parked motorcycles, sporadically parked throughout the lot. Number two, no defined lane in and out of the parking area. Number three, several vehicles and trailers parked in the entrance exit of the property. Number four, no possible way for EMS or fire department apparatus to enter the property in an emergency situation. Number five, patrons were parking in the Halligan's lot across the street, crossing four lanes of Route 20 with no protection of crosswalk or traffic lights. And number six, the event is described as, in quotations, chaotic and, in quotations, poorly managed. All of these concerns and observations were relayed in person to the manager on scene, Mike Kevorkian. Mr. Kevorkian was able to clear the entrance and exit by opening up defined driving lanes to cut down the congestion as well as allow emergency vehicle access to the property. It was also relayed to Mr. Kevorkian that a pre-incident action plan should be developed through the police and fire if future events are expected. And pictures of these observations are attached and there were a total of six pictures uh, attached uh, to the incident report uh, for your review. That is the report as submitted by Captain Seal uh, on April 29th, and I will entertain any questions that the board may have. So before we move on to any questions um, for you, Chief, I just want to also um, address um, Sergeant Daniel Lamoureux's report, um, who also came to the scene at the request of Office Officer um, Keith Chipman. Officer Chipman informed um, Sergeant Lamoureux that he was a detail officer assigned to this location, but the event had become larger than anticipated and he was having trouble handling pedestrian and motor vehicle traffic. Um, and then it goes on to um, speak to um, Sergeant Lamoureux and Officer Chipman's observations that day. Regarding just the two reports that you just heard, Mr. Kevorkian, do you have any questions for the chief? No. No. Okay. We'll now hear from you regarding what we've heard so far in the reports, Mr. Kevorkian. Uh, as far as the egress in and out, we I was unaware of the 12-foot 12 12 wide road that needed to be made for EMS or fire trucks. 
Um, we did take that into consideration, uh, as he stated, and made an entranceway in and out. Um, as far as the vehicles that were parked in the entranceway, there were no vehicles parked in the entranceway. We did have vendors that were parked off to the side, um, but it did get a little bit larger than we anticipated. Chief or uh, Ms. Jacobson, do you have any questions for the um, license holder? No, no, not at this time. I'll now open it up to board members for any questions they may have to the chief or um, to the manager. So, are Mr. Berthiam, uh, through the chair, are we uh, saving comments or just we're, we're saving comments questions? until after the hearing closes? Okay. So, so we'll we'll what will happen is we'll ask questions regarding any incidents that happened. We'll open it up to um, statements made by the people who were sworn in. Um, we'll see if there are any additional comments. We'll close the hearing, and then board members will deliberate on what their findings are and take any action at that time. Okay. So one question that I have is uh, to Mr. Kavokian, um, how many employees did you have on staff uh, that day um, for, for that event? Roughly 50. 50. And how many were designated for... Uh, safety slash crowd control. I know you probably have plenty of you know, people in store and 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 you know in the with the motorcycles and such. But how many were there, kind of just for crowd control and safety? I would say, including myself, four. Four. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any further questions, Mr. Holstrom? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, from the uh, reports I had read, there was a lot of smoke drifting across Route 20. Um, I can understand a little bit starting to drift across Route 20, but when it got to a point where they had to shut the road down, you couldn't see it. Why was the um, event not stopped at that point and somebody said, you know what, we can't have this anymore? It was a significant safety issue. Is there a reason why that uh, nobody went out and uh, told them to uh, stop? Well, at the time that um Everybody started to show up and raise questions and concerns was literally it's it's three 20 minute shows and it was the final show where all of the stunt riders that happened to be there at the same time uh, as kind of like a grand finale during fireworks they all burned the tire off the bike um, so that was literally the final show okay. uh, and that was their way of closing out well I guess um, my question would be, why was I stopped a little bit ahead of time? The reason I ask that question is, um, we are allowed burning in town from January 15th to May 1st, if that's, those are the correct dates. Uh, and there is a specific requirement, you can only burn so big a brush, uh, you can't burn pallets, you can't burn construction material, and you can't burn tires. That's basically burning tires. Um, that's air pollution and along with that air pollution the noise of the motors and of the tires on the on the pavement is noise pollution uh, and I've had several calls regarding this saying that uh, it's been significant um, when you started to see it I guess my question is why wasn't somebody saying stop this um, well in our defense we, we had every permit possible um, from food vendors to the stunt show uh, employees to insurances to police on detail um, it was kind of well known what we were doing okay so my comment would be um, burning tires is not a safety is a safety issue but it's also pollution and it's you know what a, a health hazard it's um, something that should have never happened to begin with and uh, that's why I was asking, you know, should it have stopped beforehand? And evidently it was part of the entertainment and I don't find that to be entertainment. Any other questions? I do have a few. So um, you stated that there were three 20 minute shows. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what time those shows were? No, it started at noon time. Um, <laughs> I would say the first one was probably 1230. Um, until probably 10 of 1, 
and then there was a break in between where they changed tires, get different bikes, different riders. Um, the next show was probably between 2 and 2.30, uh, and then the final show was around 3 or 3.30. Okay. So, um, so just for the record, I received the first call um, of complaint well before noontime with the screeching tires. Um, I believe it was, I believe, because I was out of town, I believe it was about 11 a.m. I also received multiple complaints of the noise and the, the squealing of the tires all day long. That's why I'm, I'm having difficulty understanding um, the statement that you had three 20 minute shows. As it was stated by Chief Coleman, I, I was down there mm -hmm. and I heard a gentleman say, that's it. That's a, you know the end of the show, the next show in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't 30 seconds later that there was another motorcycle out there spinning the tires um, with the smoke and everything. Um, so there had to have been more than three 20 minute shows. That's or if, all. If you, if, if you don't want to call what they were doing shows, they were still doing, don't call it a show, but it was still what they were doing in the shows. Sure. They, were, they, were, they had their bikes out there, they were revving them, burning the tires, I'm not good with the terminology, but yep. they were doing wheelies or whatever you call it, and um, it was loud, it was smoky. For the record, um, I want to say that um, uh, Selectman Carpenter and I were down there, and um, I, I was very, very upset to see Officer Chipman running down Route 20 towards Teddy Bear Farms, and he literally, on a state highway, had to stop traffic because the smoke was so heavy across Route 20 that it wasn't safe to drive on Route 20. Now, I know on Route 20, on the weekends, with the new GPS systems, Route 20 is very busy because they get off at the Mass Pike in Millbury and come down Route 20 and get back on in Sturbridge because they think they're going to avoid the traffic. Shutting down Route 20 for a entertainment smoke show just is not acceptable. Um, another question I have is um, the, the parking across the street. Um, there, was, there was no parking when I arrived with Mr. Carpenter. I mean, we were directed to go across the street and park. Do you have permission from um, Halligan's? We do. Do you have a written permission? No. Okay. We would, for any future events, we've always asked for, for written permission. Okay. If they were to have an event there, then we would have to deny them a, a permission okay. because um, you would be using their lot. Um, and it was regarding the 50 employees that were there, and how many did you say were for crowd management and Four, support? including myself. Four. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Carpenter, but I believe that we were there for no less than 20 minutes and we asked for um, to speak with, to someone regarding these safety concerns and we were only given attitude by people until finally we were able to speak to you 20 to 25 minutes after we arrived and that was after um, police and fire were already on scene. So um, I'm, I'm, we weren't able to find the people who were responsible for crowd management. Um, and it, just for the record, it wasn't Sheldon who, who cleared um, the fire lane mm -hmm. when Selectman Carpenter and I were there, and um, Sergeant Lamro had come down and um, uh, Captain Steele had come down. It was um, Officer Chipman mm -hmm. who was screaming to move these bikes, move these bikes, we need to clear a lane. There was, in, in my opinion, there was no cooperation whatsoever in trying, after we had already been there for more than a half an hour, to <coughs> get vehicles, get those motorcycles moved so we could have um, a clear path. So um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing where these um, crowd control people and safety people were readily available. Um, I'm not going to discuss the um, the noise and the smoke any further until we hear from some of the abutters. I, I will say for the record that we have letters in our packet from people who live on the hill and there was a cloud of smoke billowing up the hill um, that day. Did you have something, Mr. Carpenter? I thought uh, you were raising your hand. No, I do have a question, though, um, to your point of not being able to find you on site. Is there a way when you have an event to have some sort of walkie-talkie, something? that your staff can get in touch with you quickly. I have a cell phone that doesn't leave my pocket. 
Okay. Well, nobody offered to even find you. So, you know, as Mrs. Goodrich said, we spent quite a bit of time there. Um, there was no way for us to get into the parking lot when we arrived. We had to park at Halligan's, cross four lanes of traffic, which is not safe. Um, even with Officer Chipman, who's doing the best he could, it wasn't safe for your patrons to go there. Um, for me personally, I don't think we should have any parking other than parking on your site to control who's there, how many people are there. Um, as for the smoke show, I mentioned to the chief, Chief Lucas, I couldn't see, I wasn't comfortable with the police officer having to go out and try and stop traffic. You know, I could see another tragedy occurring right there on top of the fact that you had inadequate safety for the pedestrians who were actually watching this show. If, I mean, he came right up to that steel barrier and he was doing a handstand and, you know, God forbid something happened, um, you know, it, it's just not safe. Uh, it's too small of a site for what you're trying to do. Um, the locality is very sensitive. You have the Tinker Hill residence behind you. You have people on Hill Street, Prospect Hill in front of you. Um, in addition to, I'm sure the people in North Oxford could probably hear you too. So, I mean, we need to be respectful of neighbors. You have your property rights, they have their property rights. They shouldn't be made to feel like they have to be hermits eight, nine times a year because somebody thinks it's cool to burn tires, which I've yet to find sight of, but I know a lot of people do seemingly enjoy it. Um, so for me personally, I will not support any stunt shows, smoke shows. You can have music, you can have food, that's fine, but anything else, no, no, because it's where it is. It's too congested of an area and it's too residential of an area for people who live there to have to deal with that day in and day out. Do we have any? Mr. Liberty? Uh, I have a question for Chief Coleman. Um, so I don't know if you um, would have this information if you weren't there, but they said that the two shows uh, prior to the final event, um, the final event was where all the smoke really caused trouble on Route 20. Do you know if there were any problems with safety on Route 20 with the first two shows throughout the day? I know it's hard if there wasn't that. I don't have any information to that. The first that we were made aware of it was when Mrs. Uh, Goodrich uh, contacted us um, during the third show. So I have no information relative to any issues during shows one or two. Okay. Uh, and my second question is, is there any um, state or local um, regulations on burnouts or, or tires or smoke caused from burnouts or anything like that? There, there is not. There would be no permitting process, uh, at least through the fire department. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, there would be no permitting process from any agency uh, to, to do that, uh, but certainly not, not from my department. Thank you. It would be along the lines of something similar to Green Hill Park or the, the burnouts that they do in Worcester, same idea. Um, obviously as far as the smoke, if you ever sit at a campfire, the smoke blows in all different directions, you don't know where it's going to go. I agree if it was crossing Route 20. Uh, I was obviously unaware that it was completely stopping traffic. Um, I was with you guys. Um, and to answer one of the questions that you had stated earlier, um, as far as why the screeching of the tires was earlier, they do show up around 10 or 11 o'clock, somewhere in that time frame. They set up their tents, they get the vendor's tents uh, set up, and then obviously they test ride to get comfortable with the parking lot and the size of the area that they have so that they know how much room they have to do a wheelie or to do the donuts or whatever they're doing. Um, so, so they obviously test the grounds as well. Mr. Berthiam. Um, so I guess my question would be, um, obviously things went um, worse than expected there. Did you get together with your staff and what did you, what did your staff come up with as far as, did, did you guys think that, okay, we have to change things and do things differently? Um, or do you think that this pretty much all went as expected and um, you know, would would want to do the same thing uh, 
again? Or, you know, did you talk about, yeah, this got excessive, we didn't have enough people here, we realized we have to do that. What, what, what was the um, kind of meeting with your staff afterwards after all of these fire got there, police got there, police, you know, shut down the road, that type of thing? Um, it, it, it obviously uh, allowed us to think of different avenues, how to approach it. Should we have it in the back parking lot versus in the front? Um, to where all the riders would be in the back and we can use strictly the front for more parking. Um, we did talk about that um, and quite the contrary, it was actually a very successful event for us. There was nobody that was hurt, there was uh, obviously a good amount of business that came through um, and, and when you have these type of events you don't have uh, quite frankly any idea whether you're going to have 10 people show up you don't know if the weather's going to be bad we did one in September it didn't turn out quite like the one that we had this spring before last year um, so I mean we, there's a lot of things that come into play you don't know what's going to happen as far as whether you have 5,000 people or 50 um, you just don't know that but yes we did take other things into consideration as far as where we should have it or not have it Mr. Uh, through, through the chair um, and a follow-up to that would be, um, is there consideration to, uh, you know, cutting it off at a certain number of bikes? Um, you know, where you, how, how would that affect you if, say, you had to cut it off at two-thirds of the bikes that showed up that day? Would, would that have been very detrimental to the profit that day? or? Um, do you have any kind of data that would, would that would show that? I mean, in any time as a business, if you think about the less people that you're allowing to show up, it, obviously it's going to cut into the business or profits or sales or whatever you're looking at. It's definitely going to take a toll and play a role on it. Um, I have another question for. I actually have a question for Chief Coleman. Chief Coleman. Um, the manager stated that they weren't aware of the 12-foot wide re requirement for um, safety vehicles. Um, when they receive any permits, whether it was for the propane or anything that um, that we've done, I know that um, your department participates in DCG. Would they have been made aware from your fire safety officer of the requirements for fire lanes? Yeah, I, I think if you go, and I, I do not have this in front of me, but this is standard language typically through DCG. If you were to go back and look at permits and recommendations, board recommendations, one of the recommendations that comes out of the Fire Prevention Division all, all, at all times is that fire lanes and egress be maintained. That, that's standard language in, in anything that comes out of DCG. Great, thank you. Thank you. And um, one more question for the manager. We have a letter before us um, from an, a butter who could not be here um, because she had to work, Megan McGrillis. It's a public record now. Um, and she stated that in the past um, uh, she's been frustrated with the level of uh, the loud music and stated that her first action was to contact the business and ask them simply to turn down the music. She further states that each time I was informed that they had a permit given through the town and they would not be turning down the um, music. Are you aware of any calls that came in? No. Who? For that, we didn't have not, any music. Not for that, I'm talking in general. No. general complaints. So if a, if a call similar to that came into Sheldon's more than one time, who would take those calls? I would receive them. So you answer the phone and take them directly? Absolutely. Okay. However, we, we haven't had any band outside since last year that I know of. Um, all the bands that we have had was a live DJ inside the showroom. Okay. Does the board have anything further right now? Okay. I'll now open it up to anyone who was sworn in. If you can come up to the podium, please. Give your name and address for the record. Hi, uh, my name is David Norwood. My address is 60 Hill Street in Auburn, and I have uh, two statements I'd like to read to the board. Um, I've been a homeowner in Auburn for over five years. I've lived my entire life in this town and for the most part am very happy with everything our community has to offer. One of the ongoing issues that needs to be addressed is Sheldon's Harley Davidson on Route 20. During the spring, summer and fall, they hold festivals. These festivals are loud. It's challenging to have conversations indoors with friends or family and impossible to do so outdoors while these events are taking place. I have a dog 
that hides and shakes in fear during these events due to all the noise. I replaced all the windows in my home last year in hopes of improvement. While some improvement occurred, the new double pane high efficient windows do not block out the noise and indoor conversation remains a challenge. Um, we've also had motorcycles racing up and down the street before, during, and after these events. The speed limit on a residential street is 30 miles per hour, uh, which is being exceeded during these events. I've also noticed motorcycles going in and out of the Sheldons moving in excess of 50 miles an hour. The reckless driving is dangerous and uncalled for. Uh, my wife is a registered nurse at St. Vincent's Hospital in Worcester. She recently started her new schedule working in the emergency room from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. During the last event, she was very frustrated and couldn't sleep uh, with all the noise from the dealership. I went down to Sheldon's during the last event. I couldn't cross the street to speak to the police officers as motorcycles were burning out and created too much smoke to see across Route 20. Traffic had to be stopped on both sides. Uh, the police officer directing traffic on the median couldn't even be seen. I had trouble breathing and I felt nauseous. Uh, this raises health concerns and safety concerns. After the smoke cleared, I discussed my frustrations with the police officer. Uh, once I arrived home, there was a black layer all over the back and sides of my home. Uh, the smoke traveled all the way to my home. My home was professionally painted three years ago for $4,000. I'm going to need to hire a professional to power wash the home. Uh, the ongoing noise, burnouts, and speeding are alarming, dangerous, and unhealthy. Um, as a lifelong resident of Auburn, I'm begging for a change. I have another statement at this time still. Certainly. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this is for my wife who couldn't be here. She's at work tonight. Uh, she said, hi, my name is Krista Nord, and I have lived in the home with my husband and own at 60 Hill Street uh, for over the past five years. Over the past several years, the disruption from the Harley Davidson shop has gone from an annoyance to an intolerable and unsafe. Not only do these drivers speed dangerously on Route 20, but they use our road as a joyful cut through as well, clearly breaking the 30 mile per hour speed limit. In addition to the dangerous speeding, uh, the exhaust uh, that the burnouts produce in hazardous for visibility on Route 20, the fumes and smoke travel far beyond Route 20. Uh, due to an illness at birth, I was left with only one lung. The smoke and fumes uh, produced by the excessive burnouts at Harley are detrimental to my health and well wellness, along with anyone else in this area who suffers from asthma or any other pulmonary condition. The noise from the weekend parties have become so loud that it is impossible to even have a conversation in our backyard. Furthermore, I recently started a job as a registered nurse at a local hospital where I work from 6.45 p.m. until 7 a.m. On the weekend of April 29th, I worked. This also happened to be the weekend Harley had a party. When I came home after working 12 hours, I was able to sleep only three hours prior to Harley starting with their party. All my windows closed, earplugs in, and a fan going to draw the noise, I was still unable to sleep due to the noise from Harley. I called the local police non-emergency line to inform them, and they said there was nothing they could do. So after sleeping only three hours, I then had to go back to work that night for 12 more hours, absolutely exhausted, putting all patients in my care at risk. A change needs to be made. The health and safety of Auburn residents depends on it, along with the safety of those that may take care of others. While I would love to see the Harley shop moved altogether, I know this may be asking a bit too much, so instead I beg the town to deny any further requests for permits for parties from Harley. In addition, if there could be any more frequent police presence in and around the area of Harley to better enforce the speed limits and eliminate burnouts. Uh, thank you very much for your consideration in this crucial matter. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Norwood. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Um, yeah, can you hear me what you yeah. Just give your name and address for the record, please. Timmy Cronin, 68 Hill Street. I agree with everything he said. Um, I've been here for 73 years. My family moved there in 1917. So we're there before the highway business was owned. Um, this noise travels up to Appleton Road. For people who don't know where Appleton Road is next to Toyota on Route 20. Our neighborhood is affected by the noise. My grandchildren are. Uh, safety. About 11 years ago was the last time I got a, there was a count of 40,000 cars going through Route 12 and 20. Now you have one policeman trying to stop that traffic. And I went down there and people running across with their children holding their hands. Dangerous. And they stand next to the fence. And why? 
Would you let your wife or yourself or your children or your grandchildren stand there and bring in all that burnt tire smoke and the noise that affected your hearing? All you need is one motorcycle to go out of control, right through the fence and right into Drew 12 and 20. Just a couple of weeks ago, remember there was a car auction? A car went out of control and killed people. Things like that happen. And then, the then have a policeman, one of our own, down here, trying to protect people. He could get killed or hurt the way they were. They're not going 30 miles an hour through there. You come down Route 20 in Oxford, you come to 50, 60 miles an hour. You can't stop them. But you're putting everybody into, into danger and, and, and hardship. And I'm a businessman. I know what, it, what it's like. You have Harley Davidson, premier motorcycle of the United States of America. Why do you need that to sell motorcycles? You're number one. You don't need that. I don't know any other motorcycle headquarters that do it. I don't know any other town that allows this. You sure wouldn't want it in your backyard. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Is there anyone else who is going to speak? Do board members have any further questions or comments? I have a question. Certainly, Ms. Sola Liberty. Um, to the manager, um, are you aware of any other towns in and around Central Mass that do burnouts or have events like this? Sure. Uh, can you give an example or examples? Uh, Boston Harley Davidson does it, uh, High Octane does it in Bell Ricca. Um, you can Google Harley Davidson stunt shows and dozens of them come up. Do you know of any policies they have to limit the amount of smoke caused by the burnouts that they do? None that I'm aware of. That was uh, actually going to be one of my questions is how, how you get around it as far as other than not doing it. I mean, it's it is entertainment. Obviously, by the amount of traffic and the people that show up, there's some that like it. There's obviously some that don't. Um, it, it's not meant to offend or upset any of the abutters. Uh, it's part of our business. It, the, there is a whole segment uh, to Harley riders that do do this. Uh, they are insured for it. They are professionals. Um, they're just not the average rider. They, they are professionals. They're insured. They, they, there's schools out there for it. Are there any steps that you know that you could take to limit the amount of smoke caused, maybe have less cars um, doing a burnout at one time, or eliminate the finale that you did? Is there anything like that that you've considered? Sure. That's, that's where I brought up uh, doing it out back, if we were behind the building as opposed to by the side of Route 20. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have your application in front of us, but it, my recollection is that you stated you expected three to four hundred people at some of these events. Could you give me an estimate as, as to how many people you believe were there that day? I would Did say somewhere between day? six and seven hundred was my guess. Okay. And I thought when we discussed it on that day, there was an estimate that close to a thousand people had come through. Again, it, it, there's there wasn't tickets or anything being sold, so it, it, we're going off pure guess as far as what it looked like. Okay, because that's my recollection is that it was stated that close to a thousand people had come through that day. Um, Chief, do you have anything else to add? Uh, not at this time. I will have some comments later once we close the hearing. Okay, and we'll get recommendations from town administration once we close the hearing. If the board has no further questions and there are no additional public comments, once we close the public hearing, it will only be for board, um, the board and town administration to make comment and deliberate. So is there any additional comment? Seeing none, I'll attend. I have one for the chief. Sure. Um, is there a way, I know in a building there's, there's an occupancy permit. There's, there's maximum allowed. Is there something in an open air setting that would be similar, that can be achieved or arrived at? Yes, it's, um, the short answer is yes. I mean, we could, we could build an occupancy based on square footage outside in a venue just as we could build it inside. Uh, 
the laws are different in terms of how the occupancy is handled within a building and out of a building. Uh, but at the end of the day, Sheldon's is a defined space. They have their own property, they have their own boundaries. Uh, so by looking at the available space, and, and let's just take the outside, by looking at the available space, we could run some calculations and determine how many people could fit in that space, taking into consideration egress, fire lanes, parking, you know, deducting all of those things. Um, we have not run those calculations. I don't know if six to six or 700 is a good number or a bad number. I, I don't know. I can work with the building commissioner to, to figure that out. Um, I will point out though, I, I just made a note that um, part of crowd management is knowing how many people you have on your site. So if we're here tonight talking about estimates, then it is safe for me to say that we did not have proper crowd management because if, if there was crowd management, we would know exactly how many people were on the property not estimating it, give or take 100. Any further questions? Is there a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close. Is second. there a second? Any discussion on closing the hearing? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The hearing is now closed. Um, before I ask for board comments, um, I'll hear from the chief. You said you had some comments to make. Yeah, uh, just a, a comment uh, just regarding something that Mr. Kevorkian said, and he actually addressed the business aspect of this. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, uh, safety and the safety of the public sometimes conflicts with business practices. I know that's not always popular, uh, but that's the essence of, of my job as the head of the fire department and, and the person who oversees the Bureau of Community Risk Reduction for this community. Um, Mr. Kevorkian said that by all accounts, these are his words, it was a successful event. And then he said, no one got hurt, we had a good crowd. Um, unfortunately, the fact that no one got hurt at an event is not a solid measurement for the success of your event, in, in my opinion. Um, he did speak to the business aspect when he talked about limiting the amount of people. That obviously hurts the business side. Um, I, you know, I understand that. I, I understand that. Um, but I, I hope that. Uh, Sheldon's recognizes, Mr. Kevorkian did say that the staff did have some conversations, uh, town administration, the manager will present our recommendations. Uh, I hope they did sit down and have some conversations about how they could change things in the future um, because from a, from a business standpoint, I'm sure it was a very successful event for Sheldon's. From a safety perspective, with what was witnessed by uh, shift commander from my agency and what was noted by the police officers from a safety perspective, this absolutely was not a successful event. And there was much lacking and much to be desired from a safety perspective. Um, in, in order for it to be a successful event, you have to look at the event in totality not only from the business perspective, but from the safety perspective. You can't just pick and choose what, what parts make it a successful event. Um, we we want to be business friendly. We obviously want business in the community uh, you know, to survive and thrive. Uh, but everybody, not just Sheldon's, needs to do so in a manner uh, that is going to be safe for the public. And you know that's, that's why our agencies exist, to make sure that we can assist the businesses in doing that. But, um, just when I heard that comment, I just, I'd be a little remiss if I didn't say that just because no one was hurt, that's not a measure of a successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So before I ask the town administration for um, a recommendation, the next action that this board will take will um, to discuss the facts that were presented tonight um, and make a determination whether a violation has occurred with their license. If someone is to make a motion regarding a violation of the license, you would need to be specific as to the date, approximate time, and who was involved. So first I'm gonna um, turn to the town manager and ask, um, I know you had internal meetings on this um, and ask what your recommendations are. Uh, certainly, through the chair. I just wanna reiterate uh, what the chief has said from, from town administration perspective. Obviously we wanna help this community thrive. 
residents, businesses, we all need to work together. But our number one concern is public safety. And included in that public safety concern is the safety for our own uh, fire and, and police officers on site. And we felt that this particular event uh, jeopardized the public safety in general, and it jeopardized the safety of our police officers. Um, I won't reiterate everything that was said, but basically the issues were obviously the smoke, huge concern with people crossing Route 20. Um, and I'm mentioning this now because our recommendations will flow into this. People should not be crossing Route 20, no matter how many police details are there. And police details shouldn't be put there to cross people on a four-lane highway. It's just not appropriate. It's, it is not safe. It's a major concern of ours. Um, in addition to that, just the, the layout of the, the setup, the crowd was, was backed up to Route 20. Some, some places two to three deep, some places five to six deep. Had one of those vehicles gone, gone off, as Mr. Cronin said, we just envisioned, um, and unfortunately it happened three days later uh, in Linfield, but, or it might have right. been right before it. Um, had anything happened, there was a crowd of people that were right on Route 20. So that's another concern is how are these events set up? What are the safe, are there safety barriers? Where should they be and where should the event be held? And certainly having it in the front of the of the building is, is a major concern. So based on that, uh, we convened a meeting immediately when all this uh, broke. Ed Kazanovich and myself met with Police uh, Lieutenant Todd Lemon, with Fire Chief Steve Coleman, with DPW Director Bill Coyle, uh, Building Commissioner Caleb Moody. And we wanted to look at this from all aspects. So what we're submitting to you tonight, and you have it in writing respectfully, is our recommendation. So I just want to summarize quickly. Number one, we have a recommendation for your entertainment policy that would apply to anybody who's getting an entertainment policy. I think sometimes it takes events and incidences like this to see where maybe we have some, some areas that need to be strengthened. So our recommendation is for the board to consider for, for its policy to require that, uh, there are two recommendations, require that all applicants submit a parking plan for each event that details the number of parking spaces and the locations of those spaces. And this would apply to both on-site and off-site parking. Uh, the second one is for those events which are anticipated to attract 100 or more attendees. And as the chief said, if we have a crowd control manager, you'll know what those estimates are going to be. We uh, would require that the applicant would meet with the DCG's safety advisory group within one to two weeks prior to the event to review the event plan. And I want to mention that as a result of this and as a result of our meetings, we are going to be organizing uh, with our DCG as a development coordinating group. We're going to have a subset of that group called the safety advisory group. And that's going to consist of the, um, the fire chief or his designee, the police chief or his designee, the building commissioner or his designee, and the DPW director or his designee. We think that's a critical piece for these licenses to ensure the public safety and again ensure the safety of, of their employees employees and our employees and anybody who's attending those events. So those are the two recommendations for general policy and then specifically for Sheldon's just quickly. Uh, we, would, we would recommend that each event receive a separate license approval. Uh, rather than group them together. Sheldon's can submit and receive approval for multiple events at the same time, uh, provided that all documentation plans, layouts, and details for each event are provided to the DCG and the BOS, so we know the exact specific details. Sheldon's must meet with the DCG prior to each event for which a license is being sought. Sheldon's can meet with the DCG for more than one event if they provide the required documentation plans, layouts, and details for each event at that time. Again, we're trying to work with them, but we need to see details for every event. Sheldon's shall meet with the DCG Safety Advisory Group that I just mentioned to you one to two weeks prior to each event. And at that meeting, the Safety Advisory Group would like to review the documentation plans, layouts, and details for the event. On-site inspections by members or member or members of the safety advisory group on the day of the event may or shall be required. Sheldon shall have crowd managers, certif uh, crowd managers certified in accordance with 527 CMR section 10.13D. Uh, that is the um, central, uh, the excuse me, the code of Massachusetts regulations related to how you certify crowd managers, and we'd like that at each, each event as determined by the fire chief and the building commissioner. Uh, the next one is Sheldon shall provide an on-site parking plan that shows the number of parking spaces and the location of each space. Such plan shall also show the emergency vehicle access. If off-site parking is proposed, a plan must be submitted that shows how Sheldon's will ensure pedestrian safety at, at, uh, excuse me, access and egress. 
Uh, no pedestrian crossing of Route 20 will be allowed in front of Sheldon's. That is our recommendation. If pedestrians park on the opposite side of Route 20, we believe that they should walk to the traffic signal at the intersection of Route 20 and Hill Street and cross within the existing sidewalk. Sheldon's will comply with any requirements, permits, or conditions required by the state's uh, mass DOT with respect to Route 20 and its rights of way, right of ways. Uh, the DPW director had some concerns with where people were standing and were they in a state right away. And again, there may be some safety issues concerned with the smoke going across Route 20. Uh, we also recommend absolutely no burnouts to be allowed at any event. Uh, for stunt show events, which is what this event was permitted for, this was permitted for a stunt show. Um, Sheldon's must provide a professional engineer stamped plan showing the location of Jersey barriers, buffer zones, and any other public safety measure required by local or state law or by the DCG Safety Advisory Group. Again, this addresses the issue of where do people stand, where is the public standing, and where are those vehicles circulating within that area, and what's there to protect the attendees. And Lastly, we recommend a minimum of two police details must be secured for each event with the final determination on the number of details required to be made by the police chief or his designee. In other words, if it's a smaller event, the police chief is certainly understanding would not require that many. For larger events, he believes that at least two details. One detail was clearly not enough, wouldn't have been enough for 300 people, never mind 1,000 people. It's not safe. It's not safe for the attendees and it's not safe for our officers. So those are town administration recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one comment before we continue with this hearing. Um, I just want to acknowledge the dog park committee and thank you for your patience. We um, this was this. Um, issue needed to be addressed. We needed to have the minimum requirement to post a hearing and um, as I'm sure you're hearing it is a serious matter so thank you to all who are here. We will be moving on with the agenda but we do have to um, take care of this matter first. So thank you for your patience. So I'll now open it up to board comments regarding what we've heard tonight. Mr. Holstrom. Thank you Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, Regarding the issue of the uh, the burnouts, um, the manager said that we can move it back from Route 20 to the back of the building. Well, now we're going to affect Laker Street, Ames, Ames Drive, uh, the Tinker Hill residence. Um, I think it shows a little arrogance on the part of uh, the manager to suggest that we can move it back 50 to 75 feet and not many more people will be affected. Um, I would support completely no burnouts whatsoever and that I guess my arrogance will show that um, if they want to see burnouts on motorcycles, let them go to Billerica, let them go to Boston. Uh, I don't want to see it in my town. I don't want the residents to be affected. Um, the safety issues uh, going across Route 20, the people, I understand that there were some people that crossed the Jersey barriers. Um, even with traffic lights, I've seen trucks come through the intersection of Route 20 and 12 at the Oxford side coming through, coming down the road at uh, 50, 60 miles an hour. All of a sudden, the yellow light changes, the truck is still going, he's not stopping. Um, even with a crosswalk at Hill Street, those trucks, the cars, they're moving right along. And it's, uh, lights are a suggestion. <coughs> I would like to see that if they do get written permission from another lot to be uh, people to come, I would like to see them uh, be uh, shuttled at a bus. And it's not unheard of because at um, places such as um, Mount Wachusett, they shuttle people up and down the road on a bus if they want to go to an event. And they, the mountain can be overwhelmed with people and um, it doesn't deter anybody from coming in. Um, but I think that uh, I don't want to see any of the burnouts myself. It uh, affects everybody in the area, whether you move it back 50 or 75 feet at all. And my suggestion would be that, uh, you know, we don't do that at all. And even with the, the stunt riding, and I agree with what Mr. Cronin has said tonight, that, um, you know what, they are a number one motorcycle dealer in the country, if not in the world. And uh, I don't think they need to do stunts in a small area to show people what a motorcycle will do. The people that are coming there, there's probably a, a small percentage of people that have never ridden a motorcycle. They want to come and see what they're doing, but 
They don't want to see stunt riding. They want to learn how to ride a motorcycle properly. So stunt riding, I don't find is part of entertainment. I don't find it part of the sales process. Um, Motorcycle riders, if they've been riding for a long time, they know what motorcycles will do. So that's my comments. I just would like to uh, limit a lot of the movement, activity, and uh, just eliminate completely the burnouts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holstrom. Anyone else? Mr. Berthian? I'll just make uh, some comments as far as, um, you know, I am a motorcycle rider. Um, I have a friend that... Uh, own Seacoast Harley Davidson, Boston Harley Davidson. Um, they do do these shows. These shows do take place. I I do commend uh, Mr. Kavorkian for um, coming in each time, applying, uh, listening to what we have to say. Uh, we we've so far limited. Um, them, you know, cut down their hours of operation. Um, we have, uh, you know, set guidelines, and I believe that there has not been a violation. There was maybe some bad judgment. There was bad things that happened that day, um, but everything was in accordance with what they thought they got proper um, permits and um, staffing and everything else. I, I think that both of us, both the town, as we've just heard from the administration, um, and Sheldon's needs to do a lot more thorough job of planning. Um, but I, I do believe that these events are um, something that that motorcyclists and motorcycle enthusiasts look forward to. Just like, you know what, um, I'm not a, a big person for 4th of July fireworks, okay? But they're a big event for a lot of people. And I enjoy that people enjoy that. And it's not up to me to decide what is valid for somebody and what is not valid for somebody. So, although I totally agree that a lot needs to be addressed, um, I, I do appreciate uh, Mr. Kevorkian coming in, sitting here, taking it, okay, taking it on the chin a little bit, acknowledging that, you know, um, this is that there were some safety issues and that there's, there's even sound issues and everything else. And there's probably gonna have to be some, some real give and take um, because, you know, it, it, is, it is an unfortunate thing um, that, you know, in, in the case of Seacoast Holly Davidson, I think they're on Route 1 or 1A up there in New Hampshire. There's probably not the residential problem that, that there is here in Auburn. Um, so um, I totally get that we need to have events, okay, for them to, for them to be here in Auburn. Um, but I, I also think that we need to look at the board recommendations. You know, I agree, the burnouts it might be a problem because there's just nowhere for the smoke to go. It's gonna affect residents on one side or the other side. But I in no way want to stop the events um, from happening there. Um, I, I think that, uh, and we go back to Orville Sheldon with Sheldon's Holly Davidson. Um, you know, he's done a lot for our town. The Sheldon, I mean, the whole Holly Davidson dealership has done a lot. And I think that there's, there's a compromise and that we need to work together um, to make things uh, very safe. Definitely the walking across Route 20, I'm 100%. You know, I like Mr. Holstrom's idea of, of if it's gotta be, you know, people gotta park there, we're gonna, sh we're gonna find a way to shuttle them. Because, it, agreed, even if you walk down to the light, sometimes, you know, if it's direct sunlight, that, that Route 20 is just known as being a, a very tough area of road. 
but um, but I'm not going to stop supporting your events. I, I you know, and I, I appreciate you coming in, taking it on the chin, and and hopefully we're going to work something out uh, with you to to make this safe and uh, appease appeasing for the uh, the local residents, but also allow you to you know have your events and, and let bikers enjoy that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berthian. Anyone else? <coughs> Um, I, I don't think we can really comment on, on what others see as, as entertainment. I don't think that's really the board's place. Um, past that, uh, I think eliminating all burnouts um, could be a mistake. Um, we've seen, from my understanding at least, um, that the initial two burnouts done at the event um, didn't pose a threat to safety on Route 20. Um, and the damage done to someone's property could have been done from that last event where, where you've even admitted that it was excessive. Um, so I think eliminating all burnouts is really a response to the major uh, burnout, the finale that was done at the end. Um, I don't think that it's, it's necessary to eliminate all burnouts, uh, especially when we see that other towns have, have allowed it and that it is a common event. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Carpenter. Um, I guess I'm going to disagree with my two colleagues to my right. It is our job to, as the licensing authority, make decisions. I've been in office for 21 years. I've had to make decisions that have affected people's businesses. We have many dealerships in town. This is the only dealership that when there's an event, we hear complaints about. So to me, we can't say that there wasn't a problem with those two earlier burnouts because Mrs. Goodrich and I weren't there. If we hadn't called the emergency staff, who knows what would have happened. So to me, um, we live in a very small town. Bill Ricca is worlds away from Auburn, Massachusetts. So therefore, I'm not going to compare this town does it, this town does it. This is Auburn. <coughs> our responsibility begins and ends at our borders. Um, to me, the stunt shows, the smoke, I mean, when people burn as it is, I am an asthmatic and we have neighbors who's, who burn pretty much year round. We have to shut our windows, we put up with it, but this is something that doesn't need to be tolerated and it shouldn't be tolerated in the town of Auburn. We have a huge resident population on either side of this business. They're telling us, they're calling us, they're telling us I can't have a party, I can't have friends over, I can't do anything. So at, at what point do we say to them that, oh, because we have a business in town that the 60 or 70 residents or more don't have the right to exercise their private property rights to walk out their backyard, have a barbecue, have their friends over, and enjoy themselves. So, so to me, um, this has become a problem and it needs to be addressed. This board licenses this type of stuff. Um, I certainly am not going to support licensing this type of behavior in the future. Um, we have many, many dealerships in town and again, I've had not one complaint. They have events, they do various and sundry different things. This is one dealership. Why should it be treated any differently than any other dealership? We expect them to be respectful of their neighbors. I expect this company to be respectful of their neighbors. And from what I've seen and heard, that doesn't seem to be the case. So while I'm appreciative of everything that they've done, as I am of any business that does anything for us in this community, that doesn't, that doesn't make me suddenly not have responsibility for the residents of the community who are not enjoying this and are not enjoying their property. And I don't think if any of us lived over there, we would be so forgiving. And I am, Mr. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Berthian. Through the chair, you know, in, in regards to that, um, I also own a home up in New Hampshire, and I'm right on uh, Where's Beach Boulevard, where Laconia Bike Week is. And I can tell you that, that there's times that I leave my windows open at night and at, you know, 
2 o'clock in the morning, you, and I'll call him a nitwit, you get some nitwit on a bike that, you know, decides to peel out or, or rev his bike and come flying up a uh, street, which is literally like, you know, maybe less than a quarter of a mile long. So they basically have to peel out and get going and then slam on their brakes to make the corner. Um, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, we should allow this to happen all the time, um, but, you know, they, you know, you do have Laconia Bike Week, and when, when that bike week occurs, you know that there's going to be things that, that go on. Um, I'm, and I'm not saying we, uh, we have to allow everything, and, and I certainly do think we need to uh, review it and set policies and everything else. Um, but by the same token, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're talking about two different extremes and there needs to be a center line. And that's, that's where I'm at. It's, it's not, you know, you, you don't completely cut something out, um, if without trying to work it out first, then that's what I want to do. I want to try to work it out, look at the the direction and the advice of the uh, administration, and uh, so far I've seen uh, no indication that Sheldon's doesn't want to work with us. So, with that being said, uh, you know, let's see if we can find that center line, and if we can't, then then we'll readdress this. But um, like I say, I. I feel uh, very firm that that there there wasn't a violation. There was there was a, a, a probably crowd that got out of hand. Um, there was not enough staff as a result of that. Uh, there's things to learn from that, um, but we need to go on from there and work together and figure out where that center line is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other board members have questions? Um, I do have uh, a question for the town manager. I know we've had this discussion um, in the past, and I, you'll have to refresh my memory. I know the town is working on a noise ordinance, but is there also a state ordinance that regulates sound and how loud something can be? You know, it's difficult. We'd have to get the decibel machines and everything, but, but there is a, a, a current state ordinance I believe regarding noise. Uh, through the to the chair, not through the chair. Uh, I do believe that there may be something in the uh, general laws related to public health um, because of the the potential damage for noise decibels. But I do know that our our zoning bylaw review committee is in the process of uh, working on a bylaw for certain noise decibels here in town, um, and that would have to be in compliance with whatever the state had anyway. Thank you. So, um, so I've talked at previous meetings, and I'll disclose tonight. I live right there. I live on Hill Street. I'm one of the the abutters. Um, but when I on this Saturday that I recall, received so many phone calls, and um, some identified themselves, some didn't. My husband said, "You got to listen to that." Some weren't so nice. Some were, some were polite. But um, I went down there because it is a quality of life issue for the residents here in Auburn. Um, but when I went down there, it was much more than noise. I was more concerned once I went down there about the significant safety issues than I was the noise and the quality of life issues. I mean, my concern were young children holding onto the gate with their face against the steel with a motorcycle six inches from that steel doing a burnout. Irresponsible parent if you want, but we're the licensing authority. If something had happened that day, it would have been a tragedy. It would have been on our public safety officials. They are the ultimate professionals. But they also don't need to see a group of 10 or 15 individuals taken out. And when I spoke to Captain Steele, he told me, Doreen, if, some, if something lets go there, we're not talking about one or two people. We're talking about 15 to 20 who would be taken out. Um, I can, I can um, assure my board when I spoke with Officer Chipman, having arrived late in the afternoon, this smoke issue wasn't just that last burnout show. He told me directly that the smoke has been an issue all day long. 
and that's from Office of Chipman. Um, I completely agree with the recommendations that the town manager has made. Um, if we eliminate burnouts, um, that would eliminate this type of show. Um, specifically, whether they have um, been in fi found in violation of the um, their license, um, this is this is my my suggestion to the board because I find that there have been violations. When we issue a license, it's provided that all requirements of boards, town, town departments have been met, and um, <coughs> we know that there were fire lane violations through the fire department. Um, through the licensing authority, which is us, there was a cert there would ha was supposed to be a certified crowd manager on site, and certainly with the description from Chief Coleman, that um, a certified crowd manager would have been able to provide us with the information that we asked for, and not knowing if there were 600 people there or a thousand. Um, they were not in compliance with having a certified crowd manager there. On the license, if we're looking for, you know, specifically for violations, the license application estimated two to 400 people. We have an estimate of somewhere between 600 and 1,000 people at this event. That is a violation of their license. So I would um, suggest to, to my board that we have um, at least four issues there that we could find them in violation of their license on this day. Okay, Madam Chair, I'd like to, <coughs> excuse me, make a motion <coughs> that we have found violation and uh, it's through the policy of uh, section 300, policy on issuance of outdoor entertainment licenses, that states that the policy is adopted to protect, preserve and promote the health, safety, peace and order of the citizens of Auburn through the control of excessive noise detrimental to the enjoyment of life and property. This policy acknowledges and emphasizes that regulation is necessary to balance the ability of licensed establishments to have outdoor entertainment and music with the rights of those living in the area to be undisturbed by excessive noise. And that's a motion, Mr. Yes. Holstrom, is there a second? Second. So we have a motion and a second that they have been found in violation of their license. Is there a discussion under the motion? Mr. Berthio. Yeah, I'll just continue to reiterate that, um, you know, we, we have, um, you know, uh, a motion based on excessive noise, but we don't have a measurement for excessive noise. Um, so, you know, we, we hear from the residents and we know that this is an issue that needs to be addressed um, but at this point here I, I really truly believe that um, uh, you know we it's it's not necessarily a violation um, it's something that you know probably could have been handled better uh, and definitely needs to be handled better in the future but I I don't uh, I I personally don't want to hand down a violation for that excessive noise. I mean, we we knew as a board not necessarily, you know, how loud it was going to get. Uh, I'm not sure that the owners knew how, how loud it was going to get. Um, and we, you know, we've had discussion, and um, I just I just think that, you know, that event we can all take a little bit of responsibility for and. Uh, we need to all do a better job in the future. Um, I would respectfully request Mr. Um, Holstrom amend his motion to include that there were violate fire lane violations, um, violation of the um, of the license that was issued in um, excessive um, attendance, where we were quoted 200 to 400 people, and there were close to a thousand, and also um, on. Um, the issue with the certified crowd manager not having accurate information. I'll amend my motion on that. And the second, Ms. I will second Capita. it. Thank you. So, um, so we're now under discussion on the motion. And to Mr. Um, Berthium's point, um, we've we've had complaints. We've talked about this. Um, I'm not looking to end all events down at um, Sheldon's. 
that's that's not my intention I think what we've been provided with tonight with recommendations for future events will certainly help with this um, I'm certainly going to encourage um, residents to um, continue making calls to the police department informing the board if they're aware of these issues but um, I myself am looking to support the motion that they've been found in violation and then move forward with adopting these recommendations from the town manager mr carpenter if i can um pretty much for three years mrs goodrich has brought a lot of these issues up so this is not a one and done situation this is not something that just this event caused a problem we thought we dealt with it with the police details we thought you know so i think the board has looked to be very agreeable and perhaps we've been too agreeable to the fact that now it's at the situation where it's at. So I do believe that a violation or violations did occur. Um, the fact that Mrs. Goodrich and I couldn't even enter the property when we arrived is a pretty damning uh, thing for me because, again, the first thing I think the both of us said was if they had an emergency, nobody would be able to get in here. And if it wasn't for fire and police saying you need to get these people out of here, the staff seemed uninterested in finding Mr. Kevorkian. They seemed uninterested with what was going on on that property. So I guess I have a different perspective because I was there and I observed the behavior. And so that's why I'm going to support that a violation occurred because to me, what I saw was unacceptable. And we have tried over the many years to, to find that center line and <coughs> it just keeps getting wiped out by the behavior of both the patrons apparently as well as the people going there. So I think the time has come that we draw this to a conclusion and we say going forward it's not going to happen again and for this event Unfortunately, a violation or violations did occur, and, and that's just the plain facts, as I observed them myself, so. Mr. Berthian. Not to belabor this. Um, so what I'm hearing, and, and I'll, I'll change my, um, my mind on the violation of the, of the fire lane, um, because that's, as the chief said, uh, is written um, somewhere in the DCG papers. Um, as far as, um, you know, the noise, as far as the uh, times, as far as the safety, um, you know, again, we, uh, we as a board sat down at the high school uh, when we, I believe, uh, gave the permit for this event. Um, and, you know, we talked about cutting the hours, you know, what pe people were complaining because it was late at night. They were trying to get their kids to bed. Um, we, you know, we cut the hours back. We, we you know, it, it's been a give and take. And, um, and, and so, again, I, I don't, I don't think with the, with the noise situation, uh, I think, uh, you know, we asked them for an estimate of how many people were going to be there. We, when we asked for an estimate of who's going to be there, we didn't say you can't have more than that estimate. Um, so I, I, I don't think that should be included. If we want to put something that we physically have in writing, that there should be a fire lane and we want to give a violation based on that, um, I'm more than happy to go along with that. But as far as all the ifs, maybes, you know, should be too loud, too soft, and we don't have anything to really show that that's a violation, regardless of how many times we've talked. We met, we, met, we, we went face to face, we agreed with certain things, and so I don't think that we should... Um, 
you know, in, invoke a violation on, well, you know, they thought it was two to 300 people and it became 600. Next time we've learned our lesson, we're going to say, what do you think it's going to be? If you say two to 300, we're going to say, then there's not going to be more than 300. You need to cut it off there. But as of right now, I don't want to create or invoke a violation based on that. As far as the fire lane goes, I, I, I will agree with that. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else? Okay, so we have a motion um, and a second. And I'll do this by roll call vote. All those in favor of finding them in violation? Yes. Your hand. <clears throat> so we have Mr. Holstrom, Mr. Carpenter, and the chairman voting yes. All those opposed? Mr. La Liberty and Mr. Berthium opposed. Okay, so now we found them in violation. Um, do we know what their um, their next events are scheduled? Uh, through the chair, I believe when the Board of Selectmen li originally licensed this particular license that we're talking about, it was through June seventeenth. I believe that was the date. Uh, I don't think we have any events past that that we've received information on yet. Um, Correct me. Can you tell me about the two events that you have scheduled prior to June 17th? No, we don't have any major events. We only do two stun shows a year. Okay. One is scheduled for mid-July and the one that had just passed in April. Okay. And through the chair, those have not come to us yet, so I don't believe those have gone to GC DCG yet. We just went through the month of June. So, so they've been in, found in violation of their license, but we now need to determine whether there should be a penalty. And in determining that, um, keeping in mind that they have two upcoming events that don't sound similar to this at all. Um, There's you, only two. Yeah, but I'm not talking about. I'm talking about any um, entertain any dates that you have an entertainment license for, which I believe are two in June. You have entertainment license approved through June 17th. Can you describe the events that you have upcoming? One is a stunt show. One was a Mother's Day show. Yep. Can you describe the events that you have coming up in June? There was no Mother's Day show. It was a Mother's Day event. It, it, we just tag items, discounted, mark them off sale. Okay. Um, as far as for where massive amounts of people may show up, uh, we have the 10 events. We have three 10 events a year. April. I'm sorry. I'm not being clear. You have licenses approved yep. through June 17th. Mm -hmm. we, we opted not to approve your licenses for the entire year. I'm asking you specifically, can you tell me about any events that we have approved through June 17th, what type of event they are? Just normal sales. We don't have any more stunt shows or anything like that. We have three 10 events a year and we have two stunt shows. Okay. So anything that's been approved through June 17th will not be large crowds, music? Correct. Um, thank you. Do, do members want to take any action on the violation? My preference would be to leave it. Okay. So you've been found in violation of your license, well, um, it, which is a verbal warning. Um, I am going to ask next that the board um, adopt the recommendations by the Board of Selectmen, which would mean that you would have to come um, before the Safety Committee and DCG for each event, that we will not be approving any further events without that. After June or from here forward? Well, if you're assuring me that there are no events similar to this prior to what's been approved, through June 17th. That's what I don't have the list in front of me. That's what I and I apologize. Um, I just want to know what we've approved through June 17th. Uh, through the chair, if I can jump in, I, I believe uh, I haven't seen the the they had recent a list. list, but uh, the the initial list did not have any other major events, okay. um, as was stated. I believe there are a couple of sales that are scheduled, but not major events. Okay. I recall one coming up on July 15th. 
Is that, that was the correct the, uh, date, which would be another Saturday. Whatever that show? Saturday is, 13th, 15th, that was the last on show. Um, but I would also just point out, in the recommendations that we're making, we are saying that we should license each event separately, mm -hmm. but that you could take a number of them together. It's for the convenience of the business to try to allow them to, as long as they have specific details on each one, there's no reason we can't look at four or five events at once, nor, nor could the board. If they don't have the details on it, we're recommending that they come in with one single, but we're trying to make it easy for them uh, if they can now they understand all the information that we'd like to have additionally if they can group those events and bring in a couple the board could do that but give each event a separate license okay. at, at the same meeting okay. so just for the record through June 17th there are no events similar to this where there will be excessive noise smoke etc no okay all right, so you've been put on notice that you've been found in violation of your license, and we will be following our license policy that if you are found in license violation again, it could potentially revoke any and all licenses. Okay? Thank you for being here. Um, I don't know what the board's um, will is, but I would um, entertain a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Board of Selectmen for en the entertainment policy and Sheldon's license. I'm sure I think a motion that we actually send this to the subcommittee for because we would have to amend the policy and maybe some of these things should just become standard conditions for our license policy. So that would be my motion that we refer to the committee. I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion to send this to the policy subcommittee, which later on in the meeting we'll have to have a new member because Mrs. Brotherton was on the subcommittee with me. Is there any discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> so voted. Ms. Jacobson, is there anything further we have to do with this? Okay. Thank you for coming in. Chief, thank you for your um, participation, input, and professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. We have one quick um, change of manager before we move on to the dog hearing. Is there a representative from the 99? If you could come forward, please. In your packet, you have um, this is. Um, an item for change of manager. Um, this has to go through uh, ABCC. If you could give your name for the record, please. Yes, my name is Ronnie Sivy. Okay. And um, could you tell us about your experience? Um, all my life, I, I guess about 40 years I've been in the restaurant business. Um, I am crowd certified. I'm serve safe certified with liquor and food. Um, I worked in quite a few different venues. I've only been in the New England area for about three years, but um, in Colorado and Arizona, I've always worked with alcohol and young employees and always making sure that we do responsible alcohol <laughs> service, which the 99 has a very good policy for that. Great. Do board members have any questions? This is a standard change of manager. Oh. So just, um, just for the record, because we do it at all hearings, just um, make you aware that we um, feel strongly. Um, I'm sorry, could I have a motion to open the hearing? Motion to open. That's so long. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The hearing is open. Thank you. So we have, um, we feel very strongly about underage drinking. The um, Auburn Police do conduct sting operations. We have um, a strong um, policy if you're found in violation of that. Yes. But um, we, we welcome you to Auburn and wish you luck. Yes. We also have a zero tolerance policy with our employees. So if there's ever an issue that it's automatic dismissal. Great. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Is there okay. a second? Uh, Mr. Holstrom and Mr. Kaplan to second. Is there a motion regarding the um, we application? We didn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad all these talk bar people waiting here. Um, all those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a motion regarding the application? Make a motion that we approve the change of manager. Second. Mr. Carpenter and Mr. Berkham second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Thanks so much for waiting. Thank Thanks you. So much Good for luck. Coming in. Good stay. luck. Our next item: a joint meeting with the dog park committee for a presentation on the recommended site or sites. Mr. Chairman, welcome. I'd like you to call your meeting to order and identify your members, please. Thank you, Mrs. Chairperson. Uh, congratulations on your Thank election you. to that post.
Yes, I'm going to introduce my committee members because we don't have fancy name plates, but I think <laughs> if we're going to stay on or get another job, we're going to demand that we get those name plates. Uh, our committee members are, to my left, Nicole Vecchio, to my right, Elise Bukowski, <laughs> I can't see all the way down. Uh, Jackie Doran, Howard Bregman, and Sarah Beth Libby, and I'm Ron Prouty, for those of you who don't know me. And for those of you that have been hearing parts of this project since last summer, as some of you have, uh, I apologize for any repetition, but we're going to quickly run through some of these slides because I know you have a new member who's anxiously looking forward to hear what we have to say. And just before we begin the presentation, I just want everyone in the audience to know, um, I know we have um, people here for this dog hearing. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear the presentation for um, for their recommendation for the site for the um, proposed dog park. The next step the board will be taking will be scheduling a um, public meeting for these proposals where we'll um, We'll take additional information from any abutters, from the public, um, but tonight's meeting we need to focus on the dog park committee and their recommendations. So, um, it's all, the floor is yours. Floor is yours. <laughs> I'm starting us off. Anyway, thank you for having us tonight. Um, so we have a presentation here that kind of summarizes summarizes for you guys the process, um, how we came to our conclusion, um, so we'd like to go through that. Um, so a quick overview um, for those who don't know. Uh, this is process has been going on for, I want to say, almost a year, if not a little bit longer. This is something that was initiated by town administration. Um, and an original site was chosen and presented to the Board of Selectmen, I believe, in the fall of last year. Um, due to challenges that came up with that site, um, the Board of Selectmen decided um, to um, have a dog park committee created um, due to the support that was um, present from uh, several residents in town. So because of that support, they wanted uh, a committee created so that um, some volunteer hours could be spent to go through the list again and, and choose a site. Um, so that's where we come in. Uh, the, all five precinct, precincts are um, represented in our committee. And our tasks were to identify possible sites for a dog park, conduct a cost analysis for the project, um, and then make a formal re recommendation for a site to the selectmen, which is why we're here this evening. Um, very simply and briefly, the dog park, um, it's a place for dogs to exercise and play off leash. As we know, um, with leash laws in town, there are no legal areas other than your potentially fenced in backyard um, where dogs can go and socialize and exercise off leash um, for people too, obviously for owners. Why do we need one? Um, it does provide a safe fenced-in area to let dogs run, socialize, and play unleashed and legally. Um, there are t areas in town that many residents um, have complained due to dogs being um, let off leash in areas where they're not supposed to be. Um, would hopefully alleviate some of those issues um, in town by giving them a specific area um, to be legally. Um, it meets the needs of currently um, $2,300, excuse me, $2,300 um, dog owners in Auburn. Those are simply the registered ones. Who knows if there are some um, in addition to that. Um, a social and exercise dog makes a better neighbor, barks less, and is more um, friendly, prevents off-leash dogs from running loose and infringing on the rights of others, such as ch children or those fearful of dogs. Uh, it promotes responsible pet ownership by enforcement of dog control laws, licensing, and shot, um, making it safer, healthier um, for our neighborhoods. 
It's a great outdoor family activity, um, encourages an active lifestyle, gives people with limited mobility um, or the elderly the opportunity to allow their dogs to get exercise um, or watch dogs at play. It provides a safe place um, for animal related events, demonstrations, um, and potentially adoptions. Um, and it makes Auburn community more attractive to those people that are considering to relocate here. So the selection process, um, we reviewed a list of approximately 25 plus available parcels um, within Auburn. The list was refined downward based on the Stanton Foundation um, grants and the committee selected criteria. Um, part of the reason this project is possible because of something called the Stanton Grants, which would fund um, essentially 90 percent um, of construction, so it would not make sense to choose a parcel of land that did not comply with their requirements. Um, remaining parcels were assigned to different committee members, which we visited in person. Um, we discussed benefits and challenges to each of those sites um, throughout our meetings. Uh, based on the criteria and the site findings, Lemansky Park was determined to be the best possible option for the location of a dog park um, in town. Uh, certain committee members met with Auburn Town engineers, um, and feedback provided by engineers further indicated that Lemansky Park was a reasonable candidate for a dog park location. Um, if you take a look at the next slide, we have a map. Um, this Option A um, shows the side of Lemansky Park where the track is. As you can see on the left-hand side, um, the proposed site would have the dog park in the left um, larger red section would be the new dog park with the relocation of the skate park to the smaller rectangle on the right-hand side. Um, on the next slide, we have um, Sorry, I have an extra slide on mine. I'm jumping on the wrong one. There we go, just because I read better from my iPad than up there. Um, what is this going to cost, Auburn? This is something that's been brought up um, many times. And like I mentioned before, um, this project is possible because of um, grants called the Stanton Grants. Uh, there are three different types of grants that come with this. Um, the first being the design grant. Um, it typically ranges from ten to $25,000. Mm -hmm. um, and in is intended to cover 100% of design costs. Uh, the next grant is the construction grant. The Stanton grants would cover 90% of the um, hard construction costs, and that range could be anywhere from $100,000 to $225,000. After that, and after the creation of the park, there's the third grant, um, the capital improvement grants. They're uh, available at 12, 18, and 24 months after the creation of the park um, for repairs, new equipment, um, et cetera, and the grants would be equal to 5% of the hard construction costs. They do not, however, cover routine maintenance. So the remaining, the big question, that 10% that's not part of this, uh, the remaining upfront costs of the 10% as well as maintenance will be taken care of as, as follows. Uh, the nonprofit group, um, the Fur Friends of Auburn, has committed to raising your remaining 10% of construction um, cost balance and aiding in um, annual maintenance costs. The DPW estimates um, annual maintenance costs to be three to five thousand dollars a year. Um, they do already maintain Lomansky Park, so this is sort of a cost that's already part of their annual maintenance cost, if that makes sense. Um, those who wish to use the park will be asked to pay a year yearly user fee. Um, a portion of those funds will also go towards those maintenance costs. Um, something also that should be mentioned that's been brought up by several um, dog owners in town is that dog licensing fees bring in um, more than $25,000 a year. Um, and that those funds are given to the town general fund and they're allocated to different things. Um, but those, those were a large concern for dog owners that um, those funds that are coming in are not going directly to the dogs, but they're coming from the dogs, and so they should therefore have a place where they can go um, 
know, legally play off leash. Um, and in regards specifically to the Stanton Foundation grants, um, they fund, this is something that was changed in the year that we've been working on this project, um, they fund 10 design grants each year. Um, as of March 22nd, seven design grant grants are still available with two um, currently under review. And we don't, I don't think we have quite an update on that, <coughs> but that's where they're at currently. With that, give you Mr. Chair. I get back. Again, just to quickly review some of these Mansky Park site benefits, why this was, to our, our way of thinking, a, a very obvious choice. It meets all of the Stanton Foundation grant requirements. It is presently maintained by the DPW not as a dog park, but the grass areas are fertilized, mowed, kept in shape, rubbish picked up by the DPW already. Uh, there is in that site 30,000 square feet, which gives you some latitude to do different things with a dog park. It's located within a recreational complex, not a residential neighborhood. And we know from our previous experience that a residential neighborhood can sometimes be a difficult place to locate something like a dog park. Uh, we would anticipate, based on not only looking at this site, but the experience of others, other communities that have dog parks, by the way there are somewhere between 25 and 30 Stanton dog parks in Massachusetts, as well as others financed by communities or by other groups, uh, totaling probably 130 communities that have dog parks in Massachusetts. So if we say Auburn, the king of the communities, we are at least lacking in that area. We would uh, anticipate only minimal disruption to the neighborhood, not a significant increase in traffic based on, again, traffic patents from other dog parks. Uh, no abutters would be in a direct line of sight of the proposed area. The availability of the access road, which is, those of you who have been in town a long time know that the Lomansky Pack is located partially on what was Brayman Street and was originally a sand and gravel pit, which the town, with funds from the state, converted to the park, along with the state putting up the skating arena, which is still owned by the, and controlled by the state. Um, the availability of this access road and its parking lot reduces the overall total project cost. And many of the sites that we looked at in Auburn are, or could be, could be usable sites, but they would require building from scratch an access road of 60 to 70 feet, building from scratch a parking area, and uh, doing considerable landscaping work to the site. The grade of Lemansky at this area is level. It uh, provides for excellent surface drainage as well as underwater, under surface drainage, which is presently in place. Um, the area that we are recommending is as far as possible ADA compliant. It will be available to people who have disabilities. It will be available to elderly people like myself or elderly dogs like my dog. And the site, very importantly, has a public safety endorsement from the Auburn Police Chief, Chief Salukas. Secondly important and equally important, the Fur Friends endorse the site, and this is important because, as has been stated already, the Fur Friends will provide for the community 
10% of the construction cost, which on the $225,000 project will be considerable. We have some dog park data, which gives you a little idea as to what other communities have done. And we looked at, or actually got a great deal of information from dog parks in Mashpee, Agawam, Yarmouth, Chelmsford, West Bridgewater, Ayr, and Fitchburg. And compared with Auburn, they vary from 40,000 people in Fitchburg to 14,000 in Mashpee. And the park area varies in size from 65,000 square feet to a low of 10,000 square feet in West Bridgewater. This gives us, because we have the total cost for each of those projects, which range from $247,000 down to a low of $94,000. It gives us some square foot cost. But as you can imagine, the bigger the park in area, the lower generally the square foot cost is because all the parks need certain essentials, whether they are a quarter of an acre or three acres. Uh, so the cost, as near as we can figure for a park that we're figuring, would be somewhere in the vicinity of $8 a square foot. Comparatively also, with the same dog park communities, eight of, uh, excuse me, seven of the, of the eight parks are located in recreational complexes. Only one is located somewhere other than a site that is generally used for recreation. And seven of the eight communities are aided in their effort by a nonprofit stakeholder who's involved in raising funds. Auburn would fall in line, at least as we envision it, with these two trends. Uh, Stanton dog parks average about $8 per square foot, and we would think that ours would be about the same. The Stanton Foundation has a higher approval rate of dog parks in a recreational complex, and seven out of the eight dog parks have an affiliation with a 501c3 organization. So Auburn is following, or at least recommending, that we follow those trends. We have for your, uh, to pre present to you tonight two options. And if you quickly switch between them, you can see readily the differences between the two. As we said earlier, the fact that there were 30,000 square feet gives you some options. Option A would have the existing skate park moved to a new location, a location that seemed to be groomed for something like this because in the last topographical change to the landscape, that area was left perfectly flat, it was graded off so it is perfectly flat and has drainage installed around that area. Um, the movement of the skate park, and we didn't do this without I think checking with the police department since the present skate park was built in honor of an officer who lost his life in a traffic accident. Maybe appropriate that we should talk about that, to which we've talked about. Um, the man who was most responsible for getting this park, skate park, built was Norm Laplash, who at the time was the head of our local cable committee. And he raised the funds and did a lot of the work that organized the present skate park. The skate park could be moved to the other location. It would be a little bit smaller. It probably would not need what the present skate park has. That's a five foot fence around it. 
which reminds me as an English teacher of Robert Frost who said, before I build a wall, I'd want to know what I was walling out and walling in. I don't think a skate park needs to wall in the skaters or to wall out anyone that would be walking by there. And so that's a considerable expense that would be saved. Um, the town engineer has looked at the prospect of moving that. He has more information, certainly has a better knowledge of what it re would require to move that. But he assures us that move it or not, he's going to have to resurface. And the moved park wouldn't require much more than resurfacing, I think, to be a usable park. Um, and so we present for you two options. And if you look at the second option, if you look at B, you'll see that B squeezes the same size dog park in between a skate park, very close to the skate park, very close to the whole parking era, area, right across the street, directly across the street. If you see the uh, entrance to the track, uh, at the end of the dog park, the other end of that access to the dog park is the children's playground. So it is squeezed in between, it would be squeezed in if that were the chosen option between the existing skate park, parking area, and the children's playground. Uh, we think this doesn't make it a particularly good site. And so to make it quickly for you, we would say our recommendation is option A. We believe that it provides adequate room for a dog park to operate safely. The site is accessible to all residents, regardless of their physical condition. This site will not require the removal of any natural buffets, including the trees and the berm, which presently block off the site, the direct sight line of homes on Oxford Street North and Rethel Street. It was a concern that was addressed at our previous meeting by Abundance on Rethel Street. We sent out 70 for notices to all brothers who live within 500 feet of any portion of Lomansky, not just a portion uh, recommended for the dog area, we had one set of homeowners come to our meeting. And they expressed some valid concerns, but one of them was their fear that the natural buffets, including the trees and the earth and berm, which rises in most places more than 40 feet above the surface of the dog park and the skating park. Those would not be moved, touched, changed in any way. As I said before, the cost of the relocation of the skate park has been addressed by town engineers. Other concerns that were mentioned were the fact that Rethel Street is potholed. Well, a lot of streets in the town are potholed, I'm afraid. Uh, we would hope that we all had good roads, but we don't. Um, the intersection of Rethel Street with Brayman Street causes hazards sometimes if people are pulling out of Brayman Street without being careful, but some of that could be I think alleviated by removal of some of the evergreen shrubbery that grows right at the entrances. Um, and maybe most important, the four friends who have looked at both options definitely support option A. And to a group that will be as important to the success the successful completion of this dog park, it is important that we keep that in mind. The other thing we have, and if Sarah would just flip to the next slide, just in case um, you don't even have, yeah, is a series of data sources where the information come from, came from. We don't want you to believe that uh, we made it up ourselves. And finally, there is a last, page which lists the 25 
uh, communities that Stanton had already constructed dog parks in before this year began, and we know that they are close to approving at least another three this year, and maybe as many as 10. Because there is now such a run on Stanton Foundation grants, there are so many communities interested in obtaining one, they have, for the first time this year, placed a limit of 10 per year that they will finance. The other reason that they do is they expect the community to do the final construction plans with help from or uh, under the supervision of a landscape architect with experience directly in designing dog parks. And they have felt, felt that there is now so much desire by other communities to use these architects that the architects uh, by supply and demand are raising their prices rapidly. So we would hope we would get in as soon as possible. Um, that concludes what we have for presentation, and if you have questions, and I'm sure you do, we'd be happy to try and answer them. Um, so we will be scheduling a public meeting to discuss this where we'll take input, but do board members have any questions right now regarding this specific presentation? Yeah. Mr. Holstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you to the uh, committee. Uh, I know you've had several meetings. Have you had any attendance by the public? And have you had questions by them or concerns by them that you've been able to address? We have had occasional attendance by members of the Fur Friends. And we had the, it wasn't a hearing, but it was a, it followed the hearing procedures in that we notified all of the abutters within 500 feet of Lemansky. Uh, we mo notified them by mail, and as I said, there were two abutters, one household, uh, who attended our meeting. There were as, almost as many people from the site that had been turned down in the fall, in November, when, you, when we turned down the Upland Street site and began looking for another one. Uh, we had people there to be sure that we weren't, I think, bringing that up again. Uh, that's what we really have had. Uh, meetings have all been televised and have all been run on YouTube and the Urban Channel. And uh, we have two letters from the two buddies who attended our meeting. Those are the only comments other than the for our friends' comments and suggestions to us. Thank you, Mr. Prouty, and thank you to the committee for all your work. Thank you. So, um, so I do have one question that we talked about previously. Um, and first of all, thank you for your work. I know you've had long meetings and you've done a lot of research. Have you been able to get any information? Um, I know that it was thrown out there at one of the meetings that um, property values decrease having a, a um, dog park um, cited near their homes. Were you able to get that information, and if so, will you have it available at the have year? Told, yeah. Realtors have told us that a dog park is the second most asked for amenity to property after good schools. Uh, it's amazing how many people walk dogs, not only in different parks in town, in different open areas in town, and on streets and sidewalks in town, but on Lemansky Park itself. I go over there almost every morning now, and Sunday morning there were, and this is in a span of 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, in that span there were eight dogs. Uh, mostly on leash, but some of them running loose. Most of them, and I would guess all of them, pretty much under their owner's control, but they were very close to a uh, adult touch football game that was going on. They were very close to a, an area that's now being used to teach young people, I would guess, 
eight to ten years old or maybe uh, younger than that to play uh, lacrosse and uh, some of them very close to the playground area so they you know there are people that use that area that walk through that area that I find it to be pretty good. Most of them carry little doggy bags and dispose of what their dog leaves in the many uh, receptacles that the DPW has placed uh, throughout Omiansky. Through the chair, <clears throat> I'd like to say that we have not found any evidence that supports your statement that the, the, the yeah, real right. estates go down. Yeah. I think it's that's not what my the statement. answer it's state, or what, it's statement or the that's statement been that's been being asked. Yeah, yeah. Been there's, no, there's no hardcore evidence that right. supports that property values go down. If anything, I'm sure we could probably find something that contradicts that. Yeah, realtors say that it, it is an asset if you're selling your home, and certainly more than a, an asset to those people who live on Rethel Street and Oxford Street North, immediately abutting Lemansky, certainly more of an asset than the old gravel pit was. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, that a realtor selling one of the homes that abuts this area would use that as a definite selling point. Um, through the chairs, if I could, um, just to add, because I am someone who tried um, to look for both sides, looking for research um, that would support either, and we did find um, several sources that um, are more simply park-related, that they're um, an increase in property value, um, but because it's such, such a subjective to the buyer issue, um, it really depends on who's buying the home. Um, and we do know, however, that um, they are the number two amenity search for, so um, I think a lot of it is subjective, um, but there is not a lot of research that would support that it decreases property values. I could say that pretty confidently. And even by logic, if you think of how the dog park population has grown in Massachusetts, someone who lives in a community with a dog park and utilizes the dog park is certainly going to be very interested in whether or not they move to Auburn if there is a dog park available to them here. Several of our committee members utilize other dog parks, the dog park in Millbury and Sutton, which charges them a small fee to utilize their dog parks. That's a Stanton dog park, but they use, use that because there is no park in Auburn. Mr. Berthian. A few questions. Um, one, the uh, proposed uh, option A here, um, are there, you know, there's several other towns now that have them. Uh, is there anyone that has one pretty much the same rectangular, rectangular shape and size that we would be able to more inexpensively buy their uh, design uh, from them or utilize that rather than paying an architect to design our own? Well, the design cost is going to be borne by Stanton, mm -hmm. not by the town. And Stanton has always encouraged that you use professional dog park architects. Now, I never knew that there was such a thing, but they evidently are. So I think that as part of a successful application to Stanton, you might want to put the fact that you were going to use that. Yeah, I'm sure you could, but there are very special parts to the dog park. Uh, just in the matter of bringing water, to the dogs themselves and uh, having some sort of receptacle where dogs can drink out is pretty specialized. The gates, usually they're double gates, so the dog gets into one area before he's released from his leash and then is ready to be put into the general area immediately. So those are the things that add to the cost, but those are also things that a professional dog park architect would make you aware of. There has to be some provision for shade and some of these 
Uh, in fact, one of the dog uh, one of the parks on our list is getting a grant from Stanton to put a shade building up. That's probably a roof with just poles on the sides, and the dog park architect would would design that one. But through the chair, in the spirit of making the dog park a success for the community of a whole, we certainly would want it to be streamlined to the community of Auburn and to meet the specific needs, um, as well as the suggestions of the leadership of Auburn, as well as the specificity of the animal control officer, the town engineer, and the fur friends, as well as certainly abutters and um, individuals who wish to use the park. So certainly everyone has their list of wants as well as the needs to be in compliance with the grant. Excuse me, Mr. Berthian, one minute. I know it's getting warm in here. If someone wants to feel free to open that back window, go ahead. I know the, the room is getting rather warm. Go ahead, Mr. Berthian. Okay, um, second question is um, we got a letter from uh, an abutter that um, suggested maybe uh, the the area. I, I, I like the idea of that area, the skating rink area, the the Lemansky Park. Um, somebody suggested the uh, the area of field where we park the cars uh, on the other side of the tennis courts. Is that was that a consideration, or is that that kind of a new yeah. suggestion to you guys? No, that was definitely a consideration. That was the area that I saw first. But then I began to see the activities that go on on that field. As I said, there is uh, touch football, adult touch football. There is child's lacrosse. Mm -hmm. There, uh, particularly when they have multi-town Soccer affairs, soccer league uses a large portion of that. Um, so that it quickly becomes obvious, I think, that you'd be, you'd have to move someone out of there in order to get a dog park, which you'd have seven days a week mm -hmm. in a fence in area that couldn't be used for anything else. So uh, yeah, we did look at it. and. We looked at all 20, the 24 sites, I believe, or 25 sites. We looked at every one of them. Mm -hmm. We visited every one of them. When we found one that we thought was worthwhile, we sent the engineer to uh, measure it, to uh, check the grades out, to see whether it really could be utilized. Just to give you an example, the last area that we kind of seriously considered as a committee is the tot lot on Boyce Street. Are you familiar with that? Okay. Went to school there. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell them that the school is no longer than the airline. Um, the engineer went over and looked at it and he said, it would be smaller by the time you put in an adequate access road to get you off Boyce Street and the area to park on. Uh, you've got kids that play there now. You've got the uh, plastic dinosaurs that are scattered through that top lot. You've got swing sets. You've got uh, a large sandbox, and those things would go. In fact, the lady across the street came and told us, "Don't you dare move anything on there. There is a uh, daycare." Santa, who comes down here every day and the kids play here and we love to watch the kids play. So, and that one is in plain view of Boy Street, of a portion of Wellman Street, and of Robert Ave. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we looked at them all very closely. There is nothing that we could see that, you know, would approach it. Mm -hmm. And through the chair, my last question um, is to Mr. Coyle, talking about the paving. Um, is and I know you have a, a whole plan of what streets are being paved uh, this year, next year, and so forth. Uh, is that is it Rethel Street? Um, is that on the near term or to be repaved? Uh, to the to the chair, uh, we looked at Rethel and we're currently evaluating the next round of streets for FY18. Uh, I don't expect it to be on this year's list. And each year, we always take a, a second look at it. It is deteriorating. 
um, you know, so we are looking at it closely, but it's not on, on this year's preliminary list, but, you know, going forward, certainly we'll look at it closer, taking, you know, additional development um, into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Coyle, if you could stay there um, since you're here tonight, could you just talk a little bit about the cost of moving the skate park and what is involved? Certainly. We, we did look at the different costs and we did attend, myself and the other engineer, uh, some of the committee meetings that they were held uh, to talk about what the cost would be and we looked at the existing skateboard park and looking at it in the near future I would anticipate it would need to be overlaid. It's, it's not in horrible condition right now but to extend its useful life you'd want to resurface the skateboard park. It's certainly very larger than what I think is really needed um, for a skateboard park so we would envision relocating that uh, to a different area um, as shown in option A um, but would be smaller so the cost to overlay that I believe we were estimating somewhere in the area of thirty thousand dollars you know to high end of 45 I think we felt as though we could decrease the cost um, for the new skateboard park by having DPW do some of the earthwork for the project so we envisioned the cost wouldn't be significantly more than what it would cost to overlay the much larger skateboard park to construct or pave a smaller skateboard park. So cost-wise, that wouldn't be significantly different. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else for Mr. Coyle? Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Thank you. Um, we have our CFO here with us tonight. We also have a report in our packet that you have um, titled Dog Revenue Slash Expense Fiscal Year 2016. Can you give us a little clarification on this report? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to clarify one thing. Um, I think it was stated on a number of occasions that dog licensing fees go to the general fund. I can tell you they do not go to the general fund. They go directly into a special revenue account uh, it's a standalone account, uh, and it's called Receipt Reserve for, Reserve for Appropriations Dog License Fee. Um, in FY16, because we're in FY17 now, I can tell you we collected $34,250. All of those monies go directly as an offset towards the operation of the kennel and expenses related to dog operations. That being said, if we look at FY18, the budget that was presented to town meeting, uh, total direct and indirect costs related to dog operations is $98,577. If we take the dog licensing fee for 16, not knowing what the actuals are going to be for 17, $34,250, the general fund revenues or tax levy is subsidizing operations by $53,977. So the dog licensing fees only supports about 35% of the total dog-related expenditures townwide. On an annual basis, at the annual town meeting, I want to refer you to Article 3, there is an offset that comes directly from dog licensing fees, this receipt reserve for appropriation that's voted by town meeting is an offset to dog-related expenditures. In FY18, that offset was $24,418. In addition to that, under Article 30, we are now making some improvements to the dog kennel by replacing the cages that have rusted out. That total cost is estimated to be $14,000. So if you take those two combined, the dog licensing fees is not even covering those expenditures. Um, so I think this is important to note because I think there's some misinformation out there that these dog licensing fees are not going back to dog-related services. That is incorrect. I can assure you that all those monies are set aside in this specific account, voted by town meeting is an offset to dog officer and dog kennel expenditures. Thank you. So um, as I said earlier, we um, it's the expectation that we'll set a, a public meeting for this. Um, the dog park committee has 
um, presented us with two options, option A and option B. Um, I appreciate everyone waiting here tonight because you have sat here all through the night. I mean, please save your comments for the public hearing, but if anyone wants to come up to the microphone, give their name, um, specifically if they have questions that they want answered at the public hearing so that we can get that information and have it available at the public meeting. Um, I think that would be helpful. If you've sat here all night and you want to just stand up and give your name, address, and whether you support option A or option B or don't support either, um, that's what I'll accept, but we cannot get into a, a debate back and forth as to option A or option B because that's what the public hearing is for. Having said that, does someone want to come up? Please. Just give your name and address for the record, please. Sir. Joe Frascola, 48 Rifle Street. Um, I just want to give you guys information that I picked on the locations that the committee um, so I have stuff here for you guys to see, the four or five locations that they mentioned, plus the three locations that have not yet been built. Okay. If I you can give it to Sharon, here. she can be sure that we I'm get impressed. it. I'll send anything else to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else who um, wants to get up? Please. David Sampson, Jr., 52 Rifle Street. Um, some of the things that Ron came up with isn't true. And option A, if you go to that corner, there's 20 or 30 foot berms there, a swale in the middle. It's not flat at all. Um, option B, you would hope you're going to lose some sliding, you're going to lose some parking. Either way you put it there, you're going to lose a lot less with option B. The kids are there constantly sliding in the winter. It's supposed to be the Auburn Recreational Complex, not the Auburn Doggy Recreational Complex. You've got a playground right there. On any given day, how is anyone, what if you have a great sunny day on a Saturday and you've got 600 dogs out of the 2,300 licensed dogs? I mean, if there's gonna be 200 dogs, 300 dogs, who knows? Who could control that with all those kids down there playing sports, running, swinging? I mean, there's kids in carriages down there, tricycles. I, I'm not sure it's really, you know, it's supposed to be for recreation, for humans. I understand they did a lot of work and should go somewhere in town. I just wondered how we slated away the other 25 options you, you guys did to, I know there's some data supporting this more so than the others, but I think some of that should be shared so we have a better understanding of how we wound up with this. Thank you. So for the, um for the public meeting if we can just have some additional information as to the other sites and specifically why they were excluded. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I just want to remind people we're not going to debate A or B tonight. That's going to be for the public meeting. Um, you can come up and then Nancy right after this gentleman. Okay. So to, um, to just expand on what I provided, um, I did go to the locations. I did receive the information from the committee. Um, so I do believe there are other sites in town that we should consider. And again, I will bring that up at the, uh, the hearing. Um, and especially if we're getting funded, I think there's a site that is being underutilized. And if the money is going to be provided by the Stanton Foundation, instead of us paying for that underutilized location, it'd be great to have them pay for it. Again, I'll bring it up in the hearing. Thank you. And. Um Thank you. Sorry, Joe Fresco again. No, no, we didn't think that. Thank you. And I just want to say, we, you know, in our packets um, that we received on Friday, we do. Um, we've just heard this information too. So we want to have the opportunity to visit the site and really walk the site and look at the site. And we also received tonight um, some letters from residents um, in support and in opposition, which we have not had an opportunity to look at. I think everyone here has sat here long enough that we can take these home and read them and be prepared for the, um, the public meeting. And um, Nancy? So I'm Nancy Sarkeesian. I'm going to speak in two capacities, one on behalf of the Fur Friends and the other on behalf of just a taxpaying resident. A um, couple things that I just wanted to mention um, that I think is really important before you make your decision. Um, we as the Fur Friends have decided for 
um, numerous reasons that we would not support option B. Um, do you want me to get into that now, or is that? No, I think we'll wait for that. Okay. I mean, it's important information because okay. we can't move forward without the 10% Absolutely. Uh, match. Okay. Um, and, you know, our hands may be tied at that point, but um, I think that it's important to hear all of the information at the public hearing and, um, you know, unless the committee wants to hear of that tonight. No, we'll wait till the public hearing. Okay. Day. Okay, and just to, to make it clear again that we are supporting option A. Um, as far as, oh, I just lost what I was going to say. Um, oh, I just wanted to ask if you would, um, and you did just mention it a little bit, um, that you did receive more than one, two, or three letters of support for this project, um, as well as other letters um, in the in the past. Some may be duplicates, some may not be duplicates, I'm not really sure. And the other, why am I losing it? Oh, can I just ask the dog park committee to clarify something about the maintenance, the, uh, the as far as the maintenance of the dog park in what capacity the fur friends, what did you say that yeah, I apologize too. When I was doing the presentation, I was looking at a version of the PowerPoint from March, uh, which is why some of my information may have been different than what was presented, so I apologize. Um, but I believe that, um, I'm not sure how it would work out, but the Fur Friends would be collecting um, monies for the use of the park, and a portion of those funds would go towards maintenance of the right. park. Assisting Sorry, so that was my fault. I, right. um, assisting in the maintenance. Yes, the park. Okay. Um, but assisting in um, in that you have committed to um, weekly check-ins right. and cleanups and helping with cleaning up the park. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to mention as a frequent. Um, dog park attendee. I would really encourage the Sampson family to visit dog parks. Um, a statement was made about 300, 600 dogs at a dog park. I would really strongly um, suggest that you visit a dog park. Um, they're never that crowded. So, you know, I'm just asking before you come up and make a statement that you just go and see. I frequent dog parks. Even at the busiest times, that's something that the committee researched, but they didn't bring up tonight. Um, even at the busiest times, which would be weekends or from four to six at night, at most 10 to 12 dogs, was it, at any given time during those busy times. So other times, usually Dick and I can, we're usually there together. I have two dogs, he has one. During the day, there's maybe three dogs there. Most of the day, there are no dogs there. So I really would, you know, just recommend that people go and visit dog parks to see how they really do operate. Um, and I think that was it. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Through the chair. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Carpenter. Had asked I'm sorry. for the microphone. I'm sorry. One minute. Just through the chair to Mr. Prouty, could we have the presentation so we could put it on the website so that people can, between now and the public hearing, have a chance to look at, see, see how you came to your conclusion, so that it's not, you know. Because I know I couldn't see anything, so. Okay, and I don't blame you. I couldn't see it yet. I wondered if anybody else had that trouble. Yes, we'll get you a cleaned up copy. Cleaned up, I say, because sometimes I have to scribble notes on these slides. And we've put together the presentation over the course of uh, January, February, March, April, four months, so that there are different versions. We'll try to get to the latest one. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. This is Jacobson. Uh, through the chair, whatever information the dog park committee wants to get us, we can put up on the website for you. Just um, email it to me, Nicole. So I just want to just take a moment to thank the dog park committee for the time and commitment that they've made to this process. I know how many meetings you've had, long meetings, long nights. It's been incredible, the work that you've put into this, to do research, analysis. Um, you, you've been great working with town administration. You know, whenever there's been a question, they've contacted town administration. Various members, I want to point out, you know, Bill Coyle, Darlene Coyle, 
Amy Contois, uh, Matt, myself, Eddie, all of us at some point have been contacted with great questions from the committee. They've done their homework. They're looking at all options, and I appreciate the fact that they came here tonight to make a recommendation to you for your consideration. And, and as I said, Site A is, is clearly the preference. Um, site B was put in there to have another option, so it wasn't just one option in front of you. Um, but clearly, they've made it clear that A is is the preferred option, as as well as the friends, and you know that is critical. Um, as far as moving forward with collecting fees, and we've spoken a little bit about that, but not that is not uh, set in stone yet. Um, how that would work? There's a lot of nuances to how that works with a public park and a private organization. So that's something that we're committed to working with the Friends on. We've had a meeting with them. We all agree it would be a partnership uh, between the town and the, and the Friends to determine a lot of the different aspects of the park, including operations, regulations, monitoring, maintenance, all of that needs to get worked out. So we're in a preliminary stage. Uh, everybody agrees to sit at the table and work together on it, but we don't have some of those types of details and may not until we go through the process with the Stanton Foundation to actually see what some of the design guidelines are, what they're recommending, and what they're going to require from us. So we commit to working with the Dog Park Committee and the Friends to ensure that we have a smooth process to get us to where we need to be, uh, depending on the site that you proceed with. Thank you. So I want to thank you. And we would like to, in turn, thank the Friends and what you call the internal dog committee, I saw for the first time, time because you've been so good in coming to our meetings to answer our questions and to give us the help we've needed. Just a quick Burton. question. Do, do we know if the uh, Stanton Foundation, um, would they support um, video cameras, um, key fob system, that type of thing as far as, um, you know, being able to control who goes in, uh, would we be able to use like a key card or a key fob system and would that fall under the, the Stanton grant? Uh, through the chair, I, I can uh, t take a, a um, shot at that one. Um, the Stanton Foundation grant, I, I believe Nicole mentioned it, so the first, the design costs which they will pay for approximately 10% of your total construction costs. So when you submit your grant application, you have to put the estimated cost of the project. From that, they will take out 10% and give you that money, 100% of that 10% for the design. The 90% construction, their dollars will not go, go toward anything that isn't related to the, to the um, nuts and bolts of the park, to the immediate site preparation, the, um, the fencing, the... The, uh, any equipment and extras do not come under the Stanton Foundation. Um, even if you had to, we don't have to because there's well, but if you were to have to bring water to the site, they would not pay for that. It's really specific to the site. Trees, buffers, fencing, um, but I don't believe that they would. That the fencing, they, they may allow us to add on some type of electronic system, but recognizing that that takes away from the construction costs because it's very, it is very costly. So depending on the size of the park, there may not be enough funds to do that. But they're, they're pretty specific, and when you go through the design phase, it's at that point that they start to tell you what you can and, and can't do with the park. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Sarkeesian. As long as you go up to the microphone. So with that being said, um, the Fur Friends, we're an ongoing group. So now once the park is built, we're not going to take off and go, whatever. It's ongoing. We'll be conducting fundraisers. We'll be doing, um, hopefully, depending on you know how things are, but we'd like to do um, you know, exhibitions, dog training, things like that, different, different things to invite different people in the community to enjoy the park, not just dogs and people that own dogs. So if we find that there's a need to install a security camera or, you know, I, I have no idea what those cost, but that would be something that we would um, talk about and actually decide on as a group and we would have to fundraise to do something like that if that was something that we found a need to do. Um, I've never been to a dog park that has that, but that doesn't mean, you know, that 
we would not do that awesome. if, if there was a need for that. That's certainly something that we could fundraise for um, and do that. Okay. So I, I guess the next step is to set the hearing date. Uh, through the chair, yeah, I, I would just set a, a public meeting date uh, just to just to present. That's right. Just to present because it's not a technical legal requirement for a hearing. So, so I, could I we think set the public meeting at seven o'clock, and I would hope that if we set it at seven, um, the dog park committee would be willing to attend. It would be the first agenda item, and you would be available to answer some questions. We won't schedule any public hearings prior to that. You want to make it six thirty? I don't know that all members will okay. attend. Okay. Can we have a date and we'll work? Uh, the, uh, through the chair, the next, if you want to have it as the first item on your next uh, board agenda, that would be June twelfth. Okay, and. Um, we will send out an email to see if board members are available any earlier than 7 p.m., even if it's 6.30. Um, if not, it will be at 7 p.m., and we'll let you know. And just to um, the Fur Friends group, what will be... Um, the, the board has been pretty consistent that um, we're moving forward with the project with the understanding that the Fur Friends is going to provide the 10%. Um, so what we would want for information from the Fur Friends at that meeting is, um, you know, where you stand, um, because we can't file the application without the commitment. So for the next meeting, if you can just let us know where you stand, whether you have pledges, whether you have commitments, whatever it is, to assure the board of that 10%. Um, because we will not, um, I can't speak from Solo Liberty because he wasn't here, but it, it's been the position of the board that we um, don't move forward till we have that 10% match. Can I say something else? Quickly. <laughs> So the town manager, as well as the dog park committee, I'm not sure if the board of selectmen has, um, we have verbally committed to make that, mm -hmm. um, you know, to make that um, agreement with them. And I've also suggested that we do a, what is that called again, dog park committee that I told you okay. that we could do? Pledges? No, 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 no. The memorandum of understanding. A memorandum of understanding. Okay. We would be willing to do something like that. Um, that's all been submitted in writing to the town manager as well as the dog park committee. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So if um, we have nothing else on this, um, we will meet again on June 12th, um, potentially at 7 p.m. If it's earlier, we'll make sure that um, notice goes out for a public meeting on the dog park. Please. Um, attend that come with your comments your um your and if you have any questions that you want answered at this public meeting if you can please email um email the board so that we can have the answers um for that meeting mr chairman would you like to adjourn your meeting yes so we would like to adjourn them <laughs> don't know he has to call it <laughs> Yes. You're adjourned? We are adjourned. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you on June 12th. Just send it to me. Can I have a motion for a yes. 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 motion for a two minute recess? So moved. Well, Aye. 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 We're, a, we're in recess. I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Anyone, um, if you could just take your discussions outside, please, if it's not part of this meeting. Moving on with the agenda, we have no communications under Board of Selectmen General items. We have a drain layers license for JD Construction. It is a previously licensed applicant. Um, do board members have any questions regarding this? Motion to approve it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. So, Mr. Liberty, just for your um, information, um, uh, the board's policy is if um, if the licensed the license applicant has been previously licensed in the previous five years, then we don't require them to come before the board. We just um, 
ask the sewer superintendent to sign off on it that he's checked references and collected the fee. Okay, great, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Under gift acceptance, according to Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, for the Fire Rescue Department from Simon Properties, which is the Auburn Mall, we have speakers in the with a value of $3,300, and they are radio speakers for the fire headquarters. Is there a motion? Motion to accept with gratitude. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Before, Aye. We, before we move, Madam Chair, can we have a letter sent, signed by the Chair? It's thirty three hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, you, yep, we, yep, we uh, typically, for for bigger ones, we do send out yep. a lot. I will amend my motion to uh, have that letter. I'll second it again. Okay. So, so a, for the motion the to accept side. with gratitude to send a letter of the board signed by the chairman. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. For, to the DPW. Um, for, from Hometown Bank in the amount of $2,500 for the Independence Day event and the Independence Day concert. Motion to accept with gratitude with a letter signed by the Chair. Mr. Chair, man, I, just want, I just want to thank Hometown Bank. They, they've been great to work with over the years. Um, and for our newest member, this is, I think, the fourth year, third or fourth year that they've sponsored the concert and some other portions of the event. And it's a huge piece for us, and we're really grateful to have them there. They um, they have a new banner that we're going to be hanging up um, the day of the concert inside the the performance show. So just want to thank them. They've they've really been good corporate partners with us. Great, thanks. Thank you. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. I thought we already voted. <laughs> okay. The next item is we have a vote on the summer meeting schedule. Um, as um, we've discussed in the past, we don't seem to have as many um, license applications come in, hearings, etc. So the recommended meeting schedule would be one per month, I believe. The month of July, we have five Mondays, so that would put the July 17th meeting smack dab in the middle and the uh, this is just for July and August and Monday August 14th with a regular schedule to resume in September and as always if needed we would call for a second meeting if we had business to take care of I'll make a motion that we set the schedule as provided uh, with the understanding that if there is business that we do meet because last year we had a terrible meeting in September and I certainly don't want to sit through another four to five hour meeting because we didn't want to meet in August. Okay. If, um, Is there a second for discussion? Second for discussion. Um, through the chair, I, I will be out of the country on the 14th. Can we make it the 21st? Would that be a problem? I, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but no, I, I can't after. see that. It would be, be one week. Right. So it's just one week so one, yep, that should be fine. That would be the following Monday. I'm sorry, um, what's the date? So it would be uh, Monday August the 21st. 21st. So, Mr. Carpenter, are you willing to amend your motion? I am. So it's July 17th and August the 21st, unless we need to meet in between those dates, obviously. And the second with Mr. Berthio. Sure. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. So voted. Under town manager items, we have the housing plan community meeting on June 22nd, 2017. Ms. Jacobson? Uh, thank you. Through the chair. I, I don't need to go through it. I just wanted you to have uh, just an update of that housing plan and where we are on it. And. Um, Tristan, for, for your information, want to give you a little bit more information on it. But we were designated as a community compact uh, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts back in February of 2016. We had three best practices that they supported when we applied, and one of them was to prepare a housing plan. And we received, we applied for it, um, and it took a while to identify the money, but once we applied for it, we were so lucky to get a $25,000 grant. So that grant is funding CMRPC and Karen Sonneberg who is a consultant also, to help us with the preparation of a housing plan. We formed a housing uh, subcommittee, uh, and we have the, the names of those who are on the subcommittee right here. I want to mention it for the public, Denise Brotherton, Ann Weston, Michael Demore, Jim Brooks, and Shannon Regan. 
and the subcommittee has been meeting, doing a great job. The, uh, the consultants are moving along. It, it's a major undertaking. There are, I believe, under the scope of services that we put out to bid, we're going to have two public meetings. I think we have a minimum of two. This is the first one. So I wanted to get it on your calendars early. And uh, again, this is going to be June 22nd, 2017. And at that time, I believe the consultants and the committee are going to present some of the data that they've collected, as well as some preliminary strategies. So we really encourage people to attend this meeting, participate, and let your thoughts be known uh, to the committee. And I want to thank them for the great job that they're doing. And uh, I'm glad to say our plan under the scope of services and under the grant is to have this whole plan done by September 30th. So it's a really aggressive, ambitious schedule. Um, but it's important to get this done. Once it's done, it will get incorporated into the master plan. So it will become, it's either chapter four or seven of the current master plan would, this would replace what's already in the master plan. Um, so the master plan committee is very excited as well because this is a major piece of it and a, a huge amount of work that would have been a challenge for them to undertake without that grant. Great, thank you. Thank you. The next item we have is 2017-2018 HMEP grant funds 20 in the amount of $2,700 for FEMA hazmat training for firefighters. Ms. Jacobson. Uh, through the chair, this is, uh, once again, we're, we're very excited that uh, through MEMA, where FEMA monies flow through MEMA, um, Mass Emergency Management Association versus Federal Emergency Management Administration. Um, we applied for, through our emergency management department, $2,700 was the maximum amount we could apply for. We applied for it and received it. And it will be to conduct hazmat training for the firefighters. This grant was specific to hazmat training. The grants are really specific, so we have to work into that system. So um, we, um, we've we been invited to submit a formal application, so we're putting that on here. Okay. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? Motion to accept. To apply for, accept, and expend funds for the 2700 for FEMA hazmat training 2017 through 2018 HMEP grant. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So voted. Next, Ms. Jacobson, the ballot question on rec recreational marijuana establishments. Yes, uh, through the chair, as you all know, we uh, you had voted to put a ballot question on the May 16th um, ballot asking the residents first of all, the backup, under the, the new marijuana, uh, recreational marijuana law, each community has the ability to put a ballot question on to ask their residents to weigh in on whether they want to have recreational or commercial marijuana establishments in their community or not. This has no impact on the ability to personally use marijuana or personally grow marijuana. This is specifically for the commercial uh, stores or establishments in town. And because the law enabled us to ask the residents, as you all voted, uh, it was a unanimous vote at the time, to put it on the ballot because the residents were given that right and we all felt that if we didn't give them the opportunity that they were afforded under the law that you know, that there may be some criticism down the road and that it was a good decision to put it on. Um, we, uh, it was, it, the yes to ban all establishments passed by a very overwhelming majority. It's you know probably two to one um, to ban. So I just want to let you know the next steps on that. Um, simultaneous to that, at the Maytown meeting the prior week, uh, actually two weeks prior, uh, the town meeting, as you know, voted a moratorium for 18 months. That was a critical piece recommended by the attorney general's office to communities in Massachusetts to give us all an opportunity to deal with the new law because the state hasn't promulgated the regulations yet. So how can we start permitting when the state hasn't decided how they're going to permit? So that also passed that moratorium. Now that the ballot question has passed to ban the facilities, we still needed the moratorium in place because we still need the opportunity to go through the process under Mass General Law for revising our bylaws. So the next step is we have to revise our bylaws to prohibit this type of establishment per the vote. So it still has to go back to town meeting, and then it still has to go to the attorney general's office and get approval. So this will likely go back to town meeting if the zoning board of uh, ZBA and planning board can get through the process quickly. It could maybe make it on for the fall. If they can't, that's why we're glad that we did the 18-month. The will give us a chance to come on in the spring. 
So either way, we've just got to get this done before the moratorium expires, which would be December of 18. So we're in good shape. It, it takes the pressure off of the uh, Zoning Bylaw Review Committee, the Zoning uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Planning Board. And it is the next step. Great. Thank you. Any, Mr. Barthium? Uh, um, as far as the, uh, the ballot question, once we get through all the process of uh, through the moratorium and have more information, um, will the, if they desire, will the board vote to put the, the distribution question back on uh, a future ballot, or is that something that's dropped for good at this point? At this point, I believe is the understanding of the board that this was a permanent the, the moratorium would have given us 18 months to decide what to do. This particular question was a question to go to the voters as to whether they wanted them or not. I don't know that the board wants to go back to the voters. I, th I don't think that was discussed. The, the reason for my question is I, I had discussions with several people afterwards and they, the way they voted they, they were very confused by the question. Um, and I'm not saying it would have changed the outcome, um, but, and, and, I, and I thought it, it's, you know, it, it really is probably a good thing that, you know, um, we don't have to stop putting pieces in place when we don't even know, uh, you know, what our guidelines are. But I, I think that in a, um, future, once we know the guidelines, once more information is provided, um, that we might want to consider, um, you know, put it in place again. Through the chair, we, we'd have to f figure out how to proceed if that's what the board wishes, only because during the 18 month moratorium, had the question failed, we would have had to follow the process for amending our bylaws to regulate recreational marijuana. Because the question passed, we now have to amend our bylaws to prohibit recreational marijuana. So once we go through the bylaw process to prohibit it, per the vote of the, of the residents, the, I, I would have to find out what the process is to come back to the public again at a future meeting and, excuse me, at a future ballot question, put the question back on the ballot, and then we'd have to go through the whole process again and revise our bylaws again. So right now, based on that vote, we have to revise our bylaws to prohibit. To prohibit, right, okay. Yeah. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, it's my understanding things can ultimately be overturned. I just don't know the process mm -hmm. for doing that. But I, I know until that is done, we have to move forward with the prohibition because that's what the residents voted. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The next item is, <coughs> excuse me, the Community Compact IT Grant Award. Yes, I just want to let the board know you voted, um, and to, to Phil, Tristan, and sorry, I keep giving you all these new information, but want you to be aware of um, some prior votes and s some good things that are happening. So recently the board voted to enable us to apply for, I think it was 42000 about $42,000 to the state for an, um, a, what's called a community compact, which is what we designate as community compact um, IT grant. and. There are certain restrictions on what you can do that for. We applied last year. We didn't get it. This year we changed our application, and the state had more applications than they had money to, to distribute. So they asked us if we would be willing to take less. So we absolutely agreed to taking less. So 28000 is still a hefty grant. So just to let the board know, that will fund the entire module of this uh, People GIS program for online permitting for our building department. The other pieces that didn't get funded were the animal, um, the, the dog licensing, and the um, public health pieces. It was always our intention to phase it in anyway, even if we got the 42, we were going to fund the, do the building permit piece first, work the kinks out, because I guess it does take a while to get a new system going, and then once we got that working, then we would incorporate the health, then we would incorporate the dog licensing. You don't do it all at once. So this way, we're just going to be going forward with the $28,000 for now. Uh, Ed and I have talked about it, and we think it's a priority that we continue. The economic development uh, plan came up with this, and the uh, plan, I believe the prior master plan had even looked at electronic permitting to make things easier. This has been a priority for us, um, we think, maybe in the fall. We'll see how the module goes, 
and once it starts getting underway, but we think in the fall it might be something that Ed and I come back to town meeting and ask for $14,000 um, allocation. We'd have to identify the funds, obviously, but to do the rest of the modules. So by the end of the year, we could have it all online. The, the two benefits of the online, number one is it's more it's more resident friendly, it's more applicant friendly. So whether it's a business, a resident, um, applying for you know a permit for or, uh, their, or a license for their dog, it, it will make it easier. And it also comes with an online payment component. Um, you had scanning capability so you can scan your plans in and send them directly to the office without the applicant ever stepping foot in this building. So um, that's one of the nice features about this. Um, it is user friendly um, and it offers people an opportunity to conduct business on off hours when they can't get here. So. It's also, um, we had put in for either two or three uh, portable iPads for our inspectors in the field. So rather than them having to come back and put all the information in the computer here, they can go from um, location to location. And while they're in the car, they can plug the information and it goes in. And then the last piece was the reporting of this system is incredible. The reports that we will be able to generate, which helps us with the new open rec uh, public meeting law, excuse me, <laughs> public, uh, public records request law that it's hard to generate those reports, so at least with this, and we get a lot of questions and a lot of uh, requests in that department, it'll make it a lot easier to put the reports out and the public can access those reports. So the public can actually go in at some point and see all the activity as well as internally. We can do that too, and we can share it with all the departments so we can keep our eye on it. Ed and I were very impressed. Ed had gone to another community to see the system at first and came back and really liked it, so that's why we've been pushing for it. So we're excited. Excellent. And lastly, the elementary school's RFP update. Yes. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, the, the RFPs were due on May 9th. Uh, the bids were due. I'm sorry. The RFP was out and the bids were due. And on May 9th, we received uh, three proposals, two for Mary D. Stone and one for Julia Bancroft. And we do not open the price proposal yet. You have to pre-qualify to make sure that they are qualified bidders before you go to the next step. We've done that and they were all qualified bids. So the three proposals can be, can now be evaluated. Until we make a recommendation as to what meets the criteria of the RFP, we can't open the price proposal. So town council has recommended that once we have a recommendation for which one would be better for the community, then we open the price proposal because that isn't really supposed to weigh into it. It's supposed to, you're supposed to get what's better for the community and even though, yes, there's, there were fees or costs associated with it, the primary parts of that RFP were for community benefit. So uh, just to let you know, tomorrow night we, had, we were trying to schedule a meeting with the elementary school advisory group because they wanted to have some input. We want to solicit their input before we make a recommendation to you. We threw out uh, four dates to the group and over the next two weeks and on any given date we couldn't get more than four of the 13 members. Um, so we, we tried some additional dates and that didn't work either. So how we left it is hopefully we'll get more tomorrow night. We sent the, the summaries of the RFPs to all the members and told them to get back to us by noon tomorrow with any, anything they want to share. So the advisory group, whoever comes tomorrow night, can meet. They just can't make any decisions or deliberate, but we're, we're there to get their input. So, and they're actually not the ones that finally make the decision, so it's fine if we don't have a quorum. We can just discuss it, get their input, and then we would be coming to you with a recommendation. But we really want their input. So we're encouraging them to get us some feedback on the information we gave them. If you're interested as well, the RFPs are available in our office. We're leaving them in the offices. I see RFPs, the bids. The packages are very large, so we're not copying them, and you're supposed to leave them on site anyway. So. Um, They'll be on site, the originals, and you're welcome to come in and take a look. Thank you. Do you have any? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, through the chair. Um, you said you've got three, two for one and one for the other one. Are you going to evaluate them and then uh, determine whether it's going to come to the board or are you going to take those RFPs and bring them to the board anyway? Our, I believe when we originally back in the fall, the board voted to have town administration work with the advisory group to come back to the board with a recommendation. Okay. Um, so that's what we're doing. So we're following that, that vote, which was to work with the advisory group, get their input, and then town administration, as town council said, the recommendation has to come from town administration on a proposal. 
to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. So we will be coming back to the Board of Selectmen, but we're trying to get you as much input as we can from that advisory group. So uh, just as a follow-up, we could, you could actually recommend that uh, that RFP isn't good for the town and we could reject it? Any any RFP, any uh, bids can be rejected. Okay. So you can, we can, either way, you're going to look at it and give us your recommendation mm -hmm. on those. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're not required to accept if, if this the town doesn't want something for any reason. You're not required to accept it. Okay. Um, at this point, I would just tell you that all three are very um, positive proposals. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Do you have anything else? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, moving on to table items, we do have um, the board of selectmen goals and objectives. Um, with the late hour, I would um, suggest that we table this till our next meeting. But um, we have 10 items here. There was discussion at our last meeting that we would now look at the fiscal year because we're already five months into this year. So, um, so Mr. Liberty, if you have any, you know, a couple of goals that you want to propose, you can um, email them to Sharon and she can include them in our packet. We just can't deliberate on them till the next meeting. Okay. Otherwise, we have these 10 proposals, which we're certainly not going to adopt 10 goals, but um, we'll be discussing this at the next meeting. Um, do any members have any items? Mr. Carpenter. Well, we started off with Officer Tarantino and I think think we should have a moment of silence for him and that this is the anniversary and she's gone I'll make my motion which is okay. for office of Tarantino okay. a moment of silence else? We have no additional public comment. We have the minutes from March 13th, 2017 and March 28th, 2017. Are there any omissions or corrections? Seeing none, the chair will accept them as written. Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All those Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We Good are night. adjourned. Thank you, Rich. Thank you.